Yeah. But um, okay, so I think we are up about in our regular numbers with our attendees, and I'm just gonna say and uh, mm -hmm. wish everyone good evening. You guys, I hope you guys got my emails. We were just catching up here with Leonard with regards to the the web page that was we were having some difficulties. Everyone was experiencing the same things. Our posts. <laughs> disappearing magically. I thought I was losing my mind in the morning when I came back and a good chunk of your quiz was missing and and I had to redo everything. So the good news is the quiz is up and uh, it will open up on July 9th for you to access. It will remain open for an entire week. So actually even a little bit more. So I'm keeping it open until the 18th, allowing you to take time that is most accommodating for you to write that. Um, I have allotted four hours for it. I think it's more than you need, but I don't want anyone to find themselves pressed to answer these questions. It has 150 questions. Some of them are true and false. Most of it is um, multiple choice and then there is also some of those are scenario based so all of them are in relation to what we have um, completed over these past weeks and uh, there is also questions included in upcoming two sessions that we have so that's going to be one seating you can't interrupt and then continue the following day so once you sit down to do your exam you have to finish it in that one go there's if you don't complete it it will run the time will run out and then you will just be locked out of it so make sure you do designate proper time for yourself to write that um, then uh, before that, we will, of course, have our presentation. So you guys have, um, sorry, after that, we will have our presentations. So you guys have booked yourself, for most part, you have, uh, and picked your topics. So, so you will be marked, yes, Jody, you will be marked out of what you have completed. So uh, it will take that in consideration. And of course, it, it, it will affect your mark. So just make sure you do answer your questions to the best of your abilities. There is a possibility to park your question if you want to, to come back and revisit, if it's something that you think is just overwhelming and you can't wrap your head around it, you can flag it and come back to it. Um, but for most part, I, I think it's, so one thing is it's not, an, it's not easy for sure. It's not an easy test, but I also want to make sure that you are prepared to write your CIC exam from it and do my best to take you there and, and help you get there. If I give you an easy exam, there is no point of, of us doing any of this if it's going to be just easy, easy peasy, lemon squeezy exams and, and questions. So, um, yeah, so that's what where we are. I send, an, as I said, I send a reminder for um, the selection of topics and dates. Everyone that is here, you guys all picked your topics and dates. This is not something for you to stress about. It's just we have some some people that haven't chosen anything yet. So I just want to make sure we remind them and they're not missing on the great opportunity. And uh, yeah, so exciting times. We are heading towards the middle of our course. Everyone excited about that? It's kind of like over the hump soon. <laughs> All right, so um, let's start with um, <laughs> let's start with uh, our our lecture today. So today we are going to talk about laboratory approaches, and this particular le lecture is actually relatively new to to um, APIC piece and, and teaching around um, for IPAC practitioners. So this very interesting approach that they took to, to um, write the lectures about the lab approach. It's 
in my mind and in my opinion is mostly des dedicated and designed around a lot of lab practices, but there is a little bit of what we as practitioners do. So you will see there are some things that I can assure you you will never do in your in your role as IPAC practitioner. No one's ever going to ask you these questions, but I think it's important to to at least have a good understanding of the concept. How does lab work? What happens there and how do they support us in day to day? So, yeah, I have a lot of <laughs> a lot of props that I use, Leonard, and some days I just go into my little storage and think, what am I going to show them today? And then, I don't know, I kind of run out of ideas and bring different things out. But this one is what my husband got me. And it's like <laughs> supposed to be like a real poo um, prop to freak everyone out. <laughs> Of course it's poop, <laughs> but look at this guy. I'm going to show you now. Let me just uh, show you really quickly this little guy. I got it from a colleague of mine. She went shopping with her child and thought of me when she saw this. It's a little toilet bowl. And um, it actually produces poop. <laughs> So I'm not quite sure what this guy is supposed to be, but anyway, there he is. And then he makes little poop. <laughs> so anyway, that's what happens when, when once you tell people you're into poop, you end up with a lot of, <laughs> a lot of stuff. Actually, did you, did you ever hear about that? Uh, uh, there's this weird video. I'll have to find it. You'll appreciate it. It's to do with this uh, uh, unicorn toy that makes like rainbow poop. Oh, I would love that. Yes, yeah. please do send uh, I me will the link. To find the link to that video for you, just for you. <laughs> I would like that. Yeah. So, and then of course I have my stress balls, like for days, like Wednesday and Thursday, when you find out nothing works. So, okay. So let's move along. All right, so as I said, this is new to APIC that we are presenting this material. So I can't really tell you what to expect in, in terms of um, exam questions coming around it. So I have included m most of the, the discussion that they would like us to, to bring up, but it is predominantly to teach us about the professional demeanor in the micro lab. So when, when you are invited into the lab, don't run around headless or or um, do any spillage of the specimens and things like that. So stay, stay and follow the instructions, what's, what they tell you to do. Um, most of us don't get, unfortunately, trained in any really lab background or any work and preparation in terms of safety or PPE. So when we come as visitors, I'll always follow the instructions that they tell us to do. And uh, so in this particular lesson, they will also, we will touch base on proper documentation and the lab activities and just about how the specimens need to be collected and what's the, what's the reasoning for it. So I can, I, when I was actually looking at information around the lab, I found out that just recently in Toronto, in our Mars lab, there is actually 19 employees that got sick in the lab and there was undergoing investigation with regards to what went wrong. So whether they got exposed through handling specimens or did they get exposed through the good old fashioned exposures, hanging out with their colleagues and stuff like that. Okay, so when we are looking into the lab, there is a couple different things that we need to recognize. There is different types of labs. However, the lab that we are going to be mostly engaged with is micro lab. There is, of course, a chemistry labs and a number of different laboratories that you will find across the, across your continuum, but micro is what we are con concerned with and what we are most going to be working most closely with. So it is 
really essential that you understand uh, what type of services they can offer to us and what kind of uh, tests are they running for us. So we need to know what is out there, what they're doing, and how are they doing it. So when you are asked for any tests, you know whether that test is going to be completed on site or it's being done by your third party lab, is it going out, and will you take more time to get these results back. So they, we use them when we are looking for confirmation of disease. So your, your patient will present with symptoms and based on the symptoms and history that we gather, usually that's done by the physicians, they will decide what type of tests they want to run to confirm the suspect diagnosis. Sometimes you will find, and I find quite common would be for um, sputum collection. When they're doing a bronch wash, you will see a full array of tests that are done. And the reason for it is not necessarily that they're always suspecting everything that the, the test is being ran for, but just because they're already collecting that specimen that is quite intense collection, they want to run every possible test. So when you sometimes, you will find something like uh, BAL is collected and you are then, of course, we immediately get concerned with TB. Always have a conversation with the physician before you act upon it, ask them, are they truly suspecting TB in this case? Or is this just a, a, one of those differential tests that they're running? So our micro labs, they will look at the, the tests, the specimen rudder management, and it's important that they do also follow and adhere to um, proper PPE donning and doffing. And often as, uh, as IPAC practitioners, this is where we would come in and provide a little bit of that education and training for them, although they're all true pros in it. You will not run into, into many challenges with, with your lab staff. They, they are trained and educated to handle cultures and they know that they're putting themselves at risk if they're not following the procedures. In Canada, when you're looking into all our micro labs, um, they're divided into different categories to begin with, and um, based on the on the size of the lab and the level that they can uh, operate at, you will see that there is different specimens can only be handled at certain labs. And all our labs are licensed under Public Health Agency of Canada. You will have um, labs visited by Ministry of Labor, by Ministry of Health, and they will be sometimes including you into their audits to um, help them get through the certification and licensing. One of the big things I find for them is uh, always if the lab is old and some of that equipment, especially the benches that may not be up to standard and it's really expensive and hard to replace. So you can think about um, like storage cabinets that are either made of wood or particle boards. So those are critical for cleaning and challenging for cleaning. So that will be something that is frequently an obstacle in older laboratories, in older hospitals. So containment levels is how do we identify the lab? So um, they're in, in four different levels sorted out in, in kind of way. So you have level one being the lowest and level four being your highest level of containment. So when you're looking into level ones, those are usually smaller labs that um, you will have at um, maybe like um, a water treatment plant or a school um, where most of our hospitals have level two labs. So as I said, your level one, so they you don't deal with any infectious materials. They're usually um, in a smaller scale. However, having said that, when you start looking at your higher level of labs, you're always building on top of level one. So you will have every level two lab will have a level one lab, if that makes sense. So what they do, they handle usually the specimens that are not uh, hazardous, they're not infectious, and they're usually, as I said, part of either water treatment plant or schools. 
So your level two containment lab, so that's what where if you enter into any of the hospitals, that's what you will find. They usually are um, using PPE to protect themselves in these labs. So that includes gloves and lab coats and of course the protective eyewear. Um, and they also have uh, those biosafety cabinets. So when you enter the lab and you will see um, they will have glass cabinets that they work under and they will handle the pathogens underneath those, underneath those glass uh, cabinets type of thing and they often will have also exhaust out of that cabinet directly outside. These exhausts are not going directly without filtration or cleanup of that air. Um, well, Leonard, you you went to school for the for that particular um, <laughs> licensing, and uh, so most I would say most of the schools that most of us went to wouldn't have a level two. But I think if you are in school for if that's your background, they probably have a higher level, and I, I would imagine some of the universities would have also higher level labs as well. So you will always have um, in these labs properly pressurized uh, environment. They will also have HEPA filters and decontamination area. So when you look at your labs, you when you enter into the lab, you're usually entering at, so if you're looking, for example, in, in your um, at your hospital lab. So there is the entrance for, for the staff that is not working in the lab. And we are usually going through some administrative uh, access, some waiting areas or um, clerical stations, and then you're working your way through. And um, as far as I've gone in, an, in any of these labs, it was usually where they're packaging their specimens or where they're, I've been invited to visit and follow through the entire process of processing the specimens when they come. I, neither one of my hospitals process our specimens beyond gram readings. All our specimens were sent out to the third party hospital, uh, labs rather. So it was very, very limited um, testing to see and some of those that were not even relevant to us as IPAC. So really was not re nothing exciting for me that I was head over heels to see in what is happening in the new world with the labs. Everything is highly automated, very limited exposure for a staff and not much to see except labeling and processing and <laughs> shipping it into these uh, coolers and then the couriers come and pick it up. And then your level three labs would be, of course, also equipped with negative pressure and HEPA filters. So one of the level three labs that I can think of would be your Mars lab. I, From what I understand, many, many years at the late 90s or so, there was a level three lab built on, um, on the west side of Toronto and the, um, the residents actually have been quite upset with having that lab <laughs> put up there and the lab never became operational. So that's what I've been told over over times. I never actually managed to find any, any documentation supporting that, but that's what I hear from my lab people telling me the story. So I don't know how, how accurate that story is. And it's definitely before I moved to Canada. So I did not witness any of that conversation actually happening in real time. Maybe one of you guys knows, maybe Leonard knows, being a lab person. So when you start looking into your level three labs, what they do process is some uh, they will process your TB specimens. They will be processing your West Nile virus and um, so, anthrax depending of what is what kind of lab it is and then also TB of course. So none of these specimens will be processed in your in your household lab. They will be only prepared and shipped but not actually and beyond that nothing will be done in your in your home hospital in your uh, home um, lab rather. 
What is really important is how they dispose of their materials, that everything that is being processed in these labs actually has to be decontaminated and before leaving the facility. So um, I will tell you a story about a contamination in the lab in this session, not right now. Uh, and then of course your level four labs. So um, in Canada, we have our level four lab is in Winnipeg and you will be sending all your specimens like Ebola or Lassa or any of those uh, highly infectious agents to um, that particular facility. This is our reference lab as well. So if you guys have been involved with um, outbreaks with uh, listeria from maple leaf or you were aware of it, that's where we were sending all our specimens. So we were sending them all to Winnipeg. Although there, the other labs are equipped to test for it, but because it was a um, outbreak on such a large scale, it was important that we are using our um, that we are using our reference lab. So other tests that they're also running there is uh, rabies. So we would be if when I was doing my um, position as a public health inspector, every time someone would send us um, an animal to be tested for rabies or if they would, um, if we had an animal in quarantine, so we were testing it through Canadian Food Inspection Agency, but also sending it to our um, to our um, level four lab. So Leonard, would we as civilians have access to the military level four labs or not? Okay, yeah, I would assume so, but just wanted to check with you. So, um, and then also, uh, they, there are certain expectations when you are running certain outbreaks. And um, so, for example, my group A strep outbreak that I had, the expectation was that the, the confirmatory test has to be completed by public health lab. And the public health lab, namely for this particular uh, group A strep was Winnipeg lab. So uh, when we were looking into the genomic matching, that's where we were sending our specimens. Although we had um, Mount Sinai run the test for us and they had the same, pretty much the same night they came up with results for us, we still had to wait for confirm confirmation from the public health to make sure that we are following the, the legal procedures. So it gave us an idea of what, of course, we are dealing with. We could put measures in place, but when it came down to legality of the management of the case, we were running it as a presumed group A strep and uh, followed that was still presumed, not confirmed until we got our results from, from our um, Winnipeg lab. So one of the images that comes to my mind, I always think of uh, Dustin Hoffman in the movie Ebola. And every time I think of level four labs, I always imagine people dressed up like him in that movie, walking around with the um, papers and respirators and so <laughs> all the, the nine yards and everything that potentially could go wrong with bursting that safety suit. That's how, where my level of panic comes when I start thinking about level four labs. I'm sure none of them are, not all of them are like that. So when we start looking into our bi biological risk assessment in relation to, to the labs, of course, you're looking into your agents and hazards that are related to the agent. So we have to make sure we review the potential for biological risk and what is what is a, what level of hazard is attached to that agent. And then also looking at the laboratory procedure. So whether the procedure itself is hazardous, maybe just the, the agent is not. However, the way we are uh, pr processing a certain sample, it could be hazardous procedure. Where are we using any aerosols or sharps and anything that could actually contribute to increasing the risk related to the specimen handling? Then we are looking, of course, into risk assessment, and that's very common and popular in IPAC worlds that we are able and capable to um, 
talk about the risk assessment, but it also comes in the lab. And when we talk risk assessment for our colleagues in the labs, we always include occupational health as well. But um, so if you are invited to investigate any of the suspect exposures, you always bring in occupational health because those the, the people that work in the lab are staff and we can provide our expertise. However, it is it has to be handled and managed by this department as well. And of course, when we have to make sure that our the staff that works and enters the lab has um, the skill set that is required, but also goes through regular annual or um, whatever is preset evaluation. So you will find that they, our labs, they are part of the hospital, but they're going undergoing a separate accreditation. So you will find that you your hospital may be a year behind or a year ahead than accreditation of your lab and. A lot of these um, requirements are set for the accreditation of the lab, and that's in addition to um, the certification that they're getting, and that's unrelated to their visits that they get from the Ministry of Labor. So they they get visited and inspected from so many different agencies just because of the risks that is that are attributed and, and can be attributed to handling of the specimens and the different risk exposures for the staff. So when you start looking into ways to protect the patients and the rest of the staff outside of the lab, but also inside of the lab, we are looking into the safeguards. So our clinical labs that process these clinical specimens, um, they will handle in in a great fashion, in great ways, these specimens. So you, again, if it is one of those labs that you have in the hospital, um, I would say Mount Sinai, Sunnybrook would be some of them, UHN, but smaller hospitals have decided to either um, use labs, a standalone labs, or actually use these hospitals to process their specimens. SickKids would be another one that is processing um, other, other hospital specimens. So if you're looking into these hospitals, how are they spent, uh, handling specimens, would be a whole different visit into that lab than one of those smaller labs that, um, that are just handling for packaging and like your um, white blood count and urine specimens and that sort of a thing. However, uh, needless to say that they still have to follow the procedures to maintain safety while handling these infectious specimens. So usually for most of your level two labs, what they do, will, they will do your clinical specimens and sero serological uh, specimens and I think that's pretty much where that fin where that would end up with with your level two labs. It doesn't go any further than that. They don't ha they will not be processing your environmental specimens for most part. They can do again very limited uh, environmental specimens, but we tend to send them out for further testing. When it comes down to the the standard microbiological practices, it is important to highlight that all our labs have policies that guide the staff how to handle specimens, how to complete certain procedures, and also what they themselves need to follow. So in terms of hand hygiene or wearing particular PPE to handle this particular specimen or working at a very prescriptive station where they're handling certain specimens. One of the big things I find is the food consumption and we, I cannot say how many times have I been brought into the lab because someone is <laughs> either eating or drinking at their bench or um, they're applying makeup or putting um, lip gloss and what have you. And it's interesting, you know, 
it's always somebody who does that. And again, it's really something to be very, very careful at us as practitioners coming into being invited into these complaint spaces. Always bring the manager of the lab with you because we really don't have much of, of um, enforcement or really beyond education with these with these um, colleagues of ours, we really can't do much. So you always bring the um, the manager of the lab with you on these when you get a complaint that someone is actually eating or drinking at the at the bench or anywhere really in the lab that is not specifically designated as their lunch room or break room. And sometimes it, these things do happen, but um, I would say in majority of situations, staff is fully aware of risks that comes with consuming food and beverage at in, in a lab setting. Other thing that I will say I have seen in, in in my early ages of of observing micro people was the pip, uh, using the mouth to to and your pipettes to to um, extract certain certain liquids that's no longer a thing and I'm so happy for that because I was always thinking if I end up having to suck through that, I will definitely inhale some of this of this good good ingredients in, in in a flask or what have you. So I was always happy that I wasn't one of those that had to handle that. And of course your policies for the safe handling of sharps, that's another big thing for, for the lab because they do handle a lot of sharp sharps in, in their day-to-day -day operations. So they it's very similar to what you will have on on the unit. So needles cannot be bent, they cannot be anything that is broken, or if they're using actual um, needles, they can be recapped. Um, they have to dispose them and any anything that's broken glass, anything like um, objects that could cause any damage or penetrate through skin, they have to be disposed in a, in a sharp container. So again, anything like needles that you would see from your um, phlebotomist themes that are coming back, they must be placed in a puncture resistant containers and placed in, sh in sharps disposal at the end. Most of them use um, the sharps that are available, sharps disposal rather on the units, but it could be also that sometimes some of these things have to come back depending on the specimens. What is really important moving forward is that when the staff is working in the lab, they have to do in such fashion to reduce any risk of creating aerosols or splashes. And at the end of the procedure, they have to clean their work work surfaces. And in my experience observing them, I would say I have never seen anyone leaving their workstation without cleaning behind them. Could be because I was there, but I think it's it's something that becomes routine for most of them. Once they're done, they just clean up and move to the next task. Some of these cultures have to be decontaminated, depending on what we are dealing with. Uh, you will see why later on. Uh, and then also, whenever we are dealing with any biohazardous materials, there must be a sign that is at the entrance into the lab that must be posted. Um, they, of course, have to um, be a part of the hospital's pest management. If they're part of the hospital, if they're independent lab, they are obligated to take care of that themselves. And uh, again, not to repeat myself, but this is important. They have to, all the staff working in the lab, they have to be properly educated, properly trained. They all carry certificates. And you will find that some of our colleagues advance in their careers and they're constantly uh, moving forward and gaining more and more education and training and beca they become a huge asset to to the labs and to the hospitals that that we have them so much so that there is only so many people that can process your specimens and you'll learn really quickly who are they in the world of IPAC. So of course the safety equipment would be the next 
piece that we have to uh, discuss here. Those would include your primary barriers and PPE, nothing different than um, that. what you would know with, with expectation of handling specimens uh, from the end of PPE. However, I think the, the, the barriers and the biological safety cabinets is something that a lot of us haven't seen until we step foot into the the lab itself. So um, you will find them in usually when they're handling uh, the petri dishes. They're working under these these cabinets. You will find that um, usually they sit on a high chair and they have a little bench, and there is their their biosafety cabinets in there. Um, so. Most commonly, you will find them wearing the lab coats, of course, but they will also wear gowns, depending again, what are they working on? And um, you will find in some instances, they will have also uniforms that are designated for them. I would say most of the times I don't see um, the the, the lab staff wearing any particular uniforms. They wear scrubs and a coat. Sometimes you will find uh, the phlebotomist will wear um, your regular street clothes and a coat. That's just acceptable. That's how it is. And when they're handling specimens or entering, if they're entering the rooms of patients that are on precautions, they will have to, of course, follow their the um, the signs that are on the door. However, for the routine practices, they will also wear uh, gloves when they're touching any um, blood or any hazardous materials. And they will also wear eyes or a face protection if there is a risk of splashes. So usually they know when to anticipate or what procedures will be um, putting them at risk from splashes. So. Um, that would be something too that they may ask you to come in and assess in terms of are they wearing proper PPE for all the procedures. So depending on what it is, um, always for, read up on their policies. Make sure that you had given yourself an opportunity to read what is within their own policies, and then you can branch out and investigate further if. Um, and looking into what, what is from the IPAC perspective that we can help them along. For most time, for most parts, I would say our labs are, are extremely self-sufficient from that end. They're rarely going to call you in. They will call you if there is any um, damage. So we had a flood in the lab. I was called in to, to help with that and um, help them figure out how to get back really fast on their feet because it was the um, the serology lab that was affected. So that does that can't stop. So we had to find a way to uh, accommodate them really quickly, bring someone overnight and work the following day, move them a little bit out of that particular area that was affected, really pulling up quickly, hoarding and things like um, like separation to make sure we are not contaminating the specimens because that's a risk when you are doing any construction you could potentially contaminate the um, the specimens and that's not what we want for sure as far as the rest of their work it's they they're perfectly capable to take a look at their specimens and make sure that they're processing and, and handling these specimens in a safe manner so when we are looking into the setup of your of your lab, you most of the labs that I've been in, I have not seen windows in them. They're usually somewhere in the middle of the building or in the basement of a building, and they don't have any functioning windows. Of course, they have to have doors, but I've never been in a facility that they had windows on on the lab. If that's the case, these windows cannot be functioned. You don't want the windows that are opening and creating new airflow and start carrying things on on that airflow that may be lifting off either plates or or any of their specimens that they're handling. All of the labs have to have eye wash stations. So um, 
you may be involved with the design of a new lab in your facility and or if they're retrofitting certain labs so sometimes you will be asked where would be the ideal location for for the eye wash stations again for any of these questions i would bring occupational health and you want something that is easily accessible for staff so they're not running around looking for <laughs> the, the the eye wash station and um, it has to be away from toxic materials materials that are toxic uh, handling of toxic materials um, you will be also looking into most of the new buildings will have already installed the HEPA filters. Again, for the older facilities, we have been in, involved and included with retrofitting. I also have been involved with um, creating negative pressure um, in one of the, um, what was it? Um, cytotoxic lab that we had they were handling the chemo specimens there and, and more of rather chemo medications so they of course had to have hoods there as well and we were looking into retrofitting that lab so you may be involved in something like that when the new uh, requirements come for the labs new standards they have to keep up in order to maintain their um their their certificate and their license so usually when the new standards come out they get a, some sort of a time frame to work within and we get involved with design or um, are consulting with, with the, um, the usually higher external engineering company or an external architectural company that help with retrofitting of, of the uh, HVAC system in the hospital. So it's important to know how it works. It's important to know that we are not sending something into recirculation. You will be presented with blueprints from um, the the engineering company. Usually those are um, a large, again, um, consulting companies that have a large department that manages HVAC systems and they're commercial and hospital HVAC systems. So it can be done just by about anyone. So they will bring you the blueprints and you sit down with them and make sure that we are not recirculating that air somewhere where it shouldn't go. All right. So I don't know if you guys ever had a chance to look or see these boxes anywhere in, in your facility. From what I understand, just talking to you, many of you didn't have dealings with, with Ebola, but this was the first time I saw this particular packaging is when we were anticipating um, potentially patients coming with Ebola. And ever since that, I keep seeing them in IPAC offices. We always have them. So what these um, these little boxes are, so they're supposed to, so because I remember I was saying um, the specimens are not to be processed by, by our um, hospital labs. So there is your infectious substance in the, in the core of it all. And then there is multiple layers of protecting that particular um, specimen. So you will see there is a watertight container. Then there is also um, a, some sort of um, a, a list of in, uh, ingredients, so to speak, or, or um, what is in the packaging always. Uh, there is a form that accompanies this particular specimen. And um, then on the outside, there is this hard card box, the corrugated hard box, corrugated cardboard box uh, that has the biohazard sign on one side and on the other side you will have these arrows pointing up indicating not to tip over this particular package. So um, when we were sending our specimens from our suspect patients, usually uh, so the process, and it's quite common, so I know it's going to be surprising to many of you. I know I was shocked. We would call um, 
the taxi, regular taxi company, they come and pick it up. We provide them with uh, the biohazard signage because by um, under the traffic law, they had the traffic act. Uh, they have to actually have clearly um, posted biohazard sign on their vehicles when they are transporting. So we would always have these signs with us and then they usually would take it to the airport and then the airport would, um, the airplane taking that particular specimen, there would be someone waiting for us and taking that specimen and then the the, um, the taxi driver will come back with the confirmation that that's been taken um, or we can receive a fax confirmation from from the um, from the lab but um, yeah so that's how it works I know it was I was I was myself surprised that we are just going to hand out suspect Ebola specimen to a taxi driver and just go with it um, sometimes it happens people refuse to take that we had a um, airplane refused to take a specimen and um, so <laughs> it, it actually has delayed significantly the procedure because then it, the next airplane had to be scheduled and um, waiting for them to take that so it does that does take significant amount of time and coordination to organize movement of the biohazardous materials out of our hospitals. Yeah, some 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 hospitals have taxi services. Like most of us, we we have a, some sort of either um, contract with them that they would be coming for these sensitive situations. We never ran into a problem with our taxi company, but there is problems with um, with Air Canada. <laughs> so want always to take our our lovely specimens that are suspected to be Ebola specimens. It never actually happened that we send anything that came back positive for Ebola, if that's of any consolation for anyone. <laughs> so now we are going to get into a little bit more, something that is more familiar to most of you. It's the collection and specimen collections. So um, I'm just going to read this and give you guys maybe five minutes to, to a break because we're coming up on an hour and I'm trying to remember to give you that five minute break every hour. So the swamps that we are collecting are usually your ARO swamps and they do include your nasal, nasorectal swamps and, and wounds. So that's what most of us deal with and what most of us see in day to day work. But then there is also nasopharyngeal swabs, which I think now it's become probably the, the the best known specimen out there in the world. I don't think there is other specimen that is so well renowned as an NP swab with, that COVID actually put on the map. And then of course there's stool specimens naturally, blood collection, CSF collection, and there is environmental swabs food and under a food collection you will also find ice and water as well. So I'm going to give you a five minute break if you want and then we come back at 7.30 to continue. Hey sorry Cornelia I was a little bit late it's Jag Deep. Just a quick question for you. How um, dare I, you being late? I know right how dare I? <laughs> <laughs> I don't I know that the recordings always, I get them back anyways, but I just wanted to know, there was a question that Sharon had asked before and it was just about like, um, would reading the slides suffice for our midterm? So I was just wondering, I, I don't know, I didn't hear your answer. So did she ask this here in this discussion here? I thought she did, that's what it said. Hold on, let me check Sorry, again. I completely missed that. No, um, but she said thank, I thought she said thank you. Okay, apparently I'm like reading through it too quick. I saw, would reviewing the slides suffice or is there additional recommended resources? Right. So you, the slides and our discussion forum is what you should definitely look into to um, <laughs> midterm anxiety kicked in, she says. Don't worry about it. I, If you read the slides and um, follow up on our, on our um, discussions, and for, for for people who are not 
who haven't been in the class, if you missed the class, do listen to the recordings because there is not possible to put everything in writing on a slide that I tell you uh, in the class. So if you missed the class, I would strongly advise you to go and listen to that again or listen for, to it for the first time. But it, it's enough, the slides, the, the actual lectures and our discussions. Um, that's only enough for our exam. It, for your CIC exam, that's not gonna be enough. You guys have to know APIC textbook cover to cover. There is no ifs and buts about that. You have to know it. So if you want to pass that exam, you may not need all that information depending on how the exam is generated, but you may find yourself in a predicament where you just did not read certain chapters, didn't focus on certain things thinking this is not important. It's everything is important. And the way they format the questions is they will give you a scenario and it's not gonna be like, um, it's not gonna be a question that says, oh, so what kind of organism is salmonella, for example? They will give you an, a scenario. And then from that scenario, they may give you four or five different questions. And some of these questions are going to be very complex and will take your time to think about it. So I have included some of those similar questions in our exam to give you the sense of what to expect as well. So most of the questions are, I would say, very straightforward, but some of these questions you will have to actually take a, take a step back, give yourself time to think about it. What am I actually asking you? And, um, use your knowledge. So it's not going to be, oh, so gram negative bacilli, what is it, right? But it's gonna be an example of a, of a scenario. And so the patient presents with certain signs and symptoms. So the, I may ask you what kind of precautions. I will not be asking about the treatment because that's not something we get involved with. We are not prescribing any medication to anyone, but, um, there are some things that you need to know, like resistance and how does that play in, in your IPAC world. So to answer the question, your uh, the lectures that we went through and the discussions are key to pass the exam because I can't cover all the topics in, in, in three hours in a great detail that you are expected to pass the CIC. It took me over a year to get comfortable in that material to take exam for the first time. So it's not something that you will, unless that's what your your fast learners, your smart cookies, I'm not like that. I need to get to my place of comfort to know I'm confident in my knowledge and go and write it. Okay, thank you. Sorry, no that, I thought I had missed, I had missed it. <laughs> so I was like, let me ask. Okay. So no, no, I, didn't, I, I completely ignored Sharon. I just chose to ignore Sharon. No, oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on about Marina. So I think oh, maybe no, I know about Marina. Things. Yes, <laughs> and I think like, I've noticed, like I know about what happened to, to her poor soul, but um, I still can't find that question from, from Sharon. Yep. It's above there. I think it's around, um, hold on, where did I see it? Uh, um, so at 6.39. Oh. Oh, yes, just right here. Yeah. Got it. Sorry, Sharon, I just decided to ignore you today. You were talking about poop and the poop pot and the, the poop, oh. all the poop stuff. So that's I mean, why you... Pr priorities, right? <laughs> It was the poop top that Mickey misses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, yes, while I'm here, like lost in 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 my little toy world, Sharon is losing her mind, worried about the exam, and I'm like, no, 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 let's talk silly things. So, is there anything? So, I want to, I guess, I want to ask you guys, how do you feel 
about the material? Is there anything that you are not feeling comfortable or confident that you would like me to revisit? I will tell you this, do call me if you have any questions. I'm happy to have a conversation with you rather than going through emails and sending stuff left, right, and center, and things may be, I may not understand what you're asking, so just give me a shout. Um, micro is heavy. Your this exam and your CIC is micro heavy. On, on our exam, I have included only a little bit of epi because we didn't get to actual epi session before we are writing the exam. So our our test is not going to be as, as heavy with epi. Your CIC exam, you have to know epi. And again, I keep repeating this, you're not gonna be asked to calculate very, maybe very limited, very simple calculations. No one's gonna ask you to st calculate standard deviations and, and calculate the p-values and they will ask you the same things that I ask you about the means, the medians, but they will ask you what type of error is this? Is it type error one or is it type error, uh, type two error? Or um, what type of, um, methodology would you apply here? Or what type of graph is this? Or what would you use, what would be the best use to um, show your your rates? And then they would show you the, the, a lot of two by twos. Um, so you have to be comfortable with recognizing the tables, the two by two tables and, but that's all for CIC. That's not going to be on our exam. So don't worry about that. Not at least now. <laughs> we will worry about that later. So um, yeah, we didn't see them because we didn't teach that yet. So when you get into, for your CIC exam, they will show you like a, a bell curve and they will give you um, a scenario and they will say, so how many standard deviations or they will give you a two by two table and then you have to figure out your odds ratios and things like that through these tables. So that's how that will work. You will not be asked to calculate anything that will take you half an hour to calculate. It's, it's just not, not working that way, but you have to be very comfortable with terminology. You have to be really quick to assess something. So you can with confidence say, this is um, type one error or type two error. Yes, I will. I will say I will share some of the questions with you. So there is already I posted in our um, where is it on our web page? Uh, I posted. I gave you example of how that looks. I don't know if you. I know Burnett tried to <laughs> answer poor soul, um, but um, okay. There is CIC sample question. Let me just show them to you. Uh, let me share the screen. So it's a lot of information for you guys that I just dump on you. And it's important that you participate in discussions because that's where you kind of practice whether you learn or not. Um, so you listening to me is great and thank you. I appreciate it, but it's not, not enough. You actually have to read and, and follow, follow through. So can you guys see the example of questions here that I posted for you? I answered them in the chat, uh, but I was the only oh, one. Oh gosh! And no, then no. the next day, I go back, and <laughs> whatever I answered was gone. I don't know. <laughs> I know it's not, not just yours. Like I'm telling you, my my I, probably a quarter of your exam was gone. And I just started sweating bullets when I saw. Like probably I had about 120. I was down. Um, 
by 90 to 90 something questions. It all just went and I thought, I am losing my mind, what's happening here? And then I went to look at the responses that I posted for you. So I know I gave all the links to Marina's post and, and I come back and I'm reading what other people were posting and I'm thinking, hold on, but where is my answer to this? And then I realized all my posts that I answered on Tuesday evening, they were all gone. So on the screen, Beth, can you see them on the screen? I'm sharing the screen with you. What do you guys see? We saw the CIC sample questions. Yeah, okay, good. So that's, I don't know how Beth is not seeing this. Yeah. Um, interesting. Yeah, so those are the sample questions. So that's how they look. Uh, I can also share some of the um, questions that I have disqualified from the test to show you how they look as well. So for example, you are a practitioner at the uh, facility and you receive a call from ER nurse and she is inquiring about a patient that could be potentially um, diagnosed with TB. What are your actions first would be one of those questions, for example. So what is the first thing that you have to do? Isolate. Okay, so I'm going to read you the pos possible answers that may narrow it down for you. So at least you don't have to try and figure out what, what did I want to say. So place a patient in a positive airflow room. Put a surgical mask on the patient and help the patient with hand hygiene. Place a droplet contact precaution sign on the patient's door or assure adequate supply of procedure masks for the staff. Mm. Check deep, you're making me laugh. <laughs> Okay, Sharon, you're too stressed now. <laughs> so you, all of you got it right, right? So it's not, it's, I don't think I put these questions to be too difficult for you. As I said, I do expect you to no majority of them. There's going to be some that you're just going to shake your head and think, what the heck was she putting this up and wasting my time? But I want to give everyone an opportunity to pass the exam. What I want to make sure is that you are comfortable going in. Um, so let me read you another one. There's one.
So I'm going to read you a question and then I'm going to read you the options. So which of the following does sorry, a virus- sorry wait, sorry, wait, Cornelia, before you go on to the second one, just a quick question. We can still isolate them without the physician confirming it, right? Oh, gosh, like, yes. If we see symptoms, we can just go ahead and isolate. Yes. Yeah, okay. so with, with in particular with TB, you don't want to wait for any confirmation, right? So uh, the role of IPAC is always the preventative piece. So whenever you're thinking about what we do is we want to prevent it before anything sets on gets on fire, right? So we, and that's we, one of the biggest things you will find is your first Probably your first challenge dealing with the physician is going to be when you isolate a patient after they ordered uh, sputum times three. We don't wait for it. You just isolate. If they, the physician needs to to be trained to know that if they're ordering sputum times three, they are the ones who are supposed to say, hey, you know what? I'm ordering this sputum three times because I'm suspecting TB, unless they're very, very clear and say, I'm not suspecting um, tuberculosis. This is potentially MAC, and I am following up on, or they maybe the patient had MAC in the past, and they're following up on that. But you have to have that conversation to make sure. If that's not clear, and often you will find like some of the physicians are quite amazing. They will write an order and say, I'm not suspecting TB. I'm testing this patient for MAC. So when you see the order, you know that they're not missing it. They just did not think this is the TB case. And this is going to be one of your biggest obstacles in, in the role of IPAC is as soon as a physician orders, and they often will order, and they are kind of sitting on the edge. They're not sure whether that is or it's not. They're ruling it out. If they're ruling it out, that's a reason to put your patient in precautions. So if they're suspecting it, and even if there is a minute, minute suspicion, that's a reason to isolate. If they are very clear saying, I'm definitely not suspecting TB, that's a different thing. But if they're kind of sitting on the edge because they don't really know, it's some of these patients are presenting with somewhat atypical symptoms or not always presenting in the fashion that are very clear. So they don't really know anymore what, what to look at. So you will run into those challenges. But any suspicion on anything infectious, we don't wait for confirmation. As soon as the symptom matches or uh, physician's diagnosis or what they say, a differential diagnosis, if they have it in differential, you go for it, you isolate the patient. So any discontinuation of precautions are only you can do it. There is nobody else in the facility who can discontinue precautions. And you have to be very protective of that role that you have, because if we start letting everyone taking off, patients off precautions, the risk is too high for what could happen. Because discontinuing precautions is not just, oh, met the negative criteria. Your patient has to meet all the criteria to come off precautions. So if if we are looking at, say, something as simple as diarrhea, and so they're not seed of positive. Okay, that's great. But did we test for something else? Or did we actually get a confirmed exclusion of all infectious agents that we are concerned with? Have we received all the negative results for OM parasites? And if you do have that, and your patient still has diarrhea, you have to set some time with the physician and have that conversation and say, you know what, I'm actually really concerned. My patient's not clearing up this diarrhea. They still have 15, 16 bounds of diarrhea or four bounds of diarrhea. Doesn't matter. If they're not clearing up in, in that period of 48 hours, you have to figure out what's going on. So it could be something that physician will tell you, yeah, it's yeah, they have this condition or Crohn's or this or that, and this makes sense for them to have diarrhea, but you have to have an alternative diagnosis. Yeah, so sorry, Jagdeep. Let's move to the next question. So I'm going to read you a question and then I'll alternative uh, answers and you guys can pick. And I'm going to tell you it's either A or B or C or D and one, two, three or four. So you don't have to guess that. So which of the following does a virus lack? Select all that apply. So A is ribosomes. B 
is metabolic processes, C, nucleic acid, and uh, D, glycoprotein. Yes, I said lac. What's, what don't they have? Which one of these they don't have? I can read the options again. So A is ribosomes, B is metabolic processes, C is nucleic acid, and D is glycoprotein. Okay. So A and B. So they do have a nucleic acid, right? So they either have a DNA or RNA. But um, and they the metabolic process occurs within the cell. So it's not something that they themselves um, are they need the host to do it. So you, of course, you know this. So it just takes time for you guys to refresh where we've been through this. So it's just the way you start thinking about it. So what do you know about the virus, right? And how does this work? What do they have, right? What they don't have? Okay. So I'm gonna give you one more. Can malaria be transmitted fr from person to person? And that's a true or false answer. Malaria. Oops. So I'm going to say false except through vertical transmission, right? So a mother can pass, if the mom is having malaria, she can actually vertically pass malaria to the baby. But otherwise, no. So when you get to your CAC exam, so I know we didn't touch on this yet, but it's something that um, I've been discussing with somebody, one of my friends who is learning and also studying for her CAC exam. So they will, for example, what they will ask you is to assess your critical thinking. So they will say, if um, you have a mother with, say, uh, TB and you're asked as a practitioner, whether she can breastfeed a child, what what kind of answers would you provide to that? For TV? Mm -hmm. Oh, my mic is still on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you better be careful what you're saying, Vernet. <laughs> yes, she has active TB. And she is being treated. But can she breastfeed? Mm -hmm. 
So the answer to that is yes, mom can breastfeed. The uh, TB is not something that's been transmitted to um, milk. So it is an airborne transmission. And then what you would say is you would probably want that mom to breastfeed and have interaction with the baby because the critical moment in that baby's life is bonding with the mom at this point. And if you miss the boat for that bonding, it does affect the further development of the baby. And the reason for it is that we can safely manage this and we can actually in, provide a safe environment for the mom and make sure the baby is safe while mom is breastfeeding by simple thing, providing a mask to mom. So those are kind of things that you guys have to kind of think, can we protect and prevent spread from happening? If the answer is yes, then you proceed with the safe, fa in, pr proceed in a f uh, safe fashion. Um, if there is something that is potentially transmitted through breast milk, in that case, you would say no to breastfeeding, but mom still can bond with the baby. So it's very, very few instances where we are saying no to that because mom and, and baby are always seen as a one unit. And I think that may help you moving forward. We never see them as separate. They're always seen as one unit and keep that in mind when you're, when you're going through these questions in, in your CIC exam. So I'm going to read one more and then we are going to move along because I don't want to um, keep us late if towards the end of the class, maybe if we can focus on give more time to this, I'm happy to help you with this. So um, the next question is, which of the following microorganisms is not spore forming organism? So I'm going to read you to read the names to you. C. difficile. Bacillus subtilis, Clostridium perfringens, and Kleb pneumonia. So the question is, which one is not spore forming organism? So, so again, I'm going to repeat it for you. So which of the following organisms are not spore forming? C. difficile, Bacillus subtilis, Clostridium perfringens, and Klebnumo. Thanks, Corinne, for changing your answer. So it's Kleb Pneuma, right? That's the only one that doesn't create spores. So remember when we were studying about your C. difficile and, and C. perfringens. So if you think about C. difficile would be the easy um, giveaway, right? So we know that's the one that's really hard to kill in in the uh, healthcare setting. So you know it's not that one. And then you're looking at Clostridium perfringens. So that's another family. They're related, but so is Bacillus subtilis. So there, the Bacillus subtilis is also a producer of a spore. And then what we do know is that Kleb pneumo is not a spore forming organism. So if you kind of find yourself navigating through some of these, just take 
give yourself a breather. You you know the answers, and that's that's what is most critical for you to remember is that you do know the answers. You just have to think about it. So for each each question, you get about a minute and a half to answer. So standard from what I was investigating and researching is about a minute. And then when I was doing the test myself, you don't need a minute for every of these questions. If you find yourself in that you're spending way too much time on, on some of these that are more complex maybe, flag them, park them away and move along and then you can come back at, at towards the end. And you may actually find an answer somewhere else in these other questions coming up that may actually help you answer some of these more challenging questions. Okay, all right. You're very funny. You don't need that much time. I'm telling you. So if you, when you start looking into these questions, you will see some of them are super, super, super simple. I'm reading some to you that are a little bit more um, difficult and they take some time to think. Some of them are very, very simple. Okay. But I will tell you, there is some, one that I wrote and I'm thinking I'm reading it and I'm thinking, what was I writing? Was I drunk or tired when I wrote this? So I had to go back and reread all my, my questions because I think I just messed up the, the grammar in, in the way I wrote it and I couldn't make out what did I want to say. <laughs> yeah, drunk and love, I'm in deep. Okay, let's move along. Okay, so when we start looking into our collection of swaps, I already said to you guys, you are most common, common and, and friendly with the MRSA VRE swaps. So what are some of the criteria that are um, requiring us to swab our patients? So this is all outside of COVID. And for all, all of you that entered the world of IPAC, just, and this is your only experience with COVID, it's, I, I really feel bad for you because there is so much more that we do and there is so much greatness in the job that we do every day and, and so much complexity that is just amazing how, how IPAC functions and what, what we touch in a day. COVID has put on hold a lot of things. And for you guys that have been in the field for a while and know what I'm talking about, you know, we stopped doing a lot of basic stuff that would be considered bread and butter for IPAC. So your criteria is usually set through the policies in your own facility. And usually we are looking at when we are setting the criteria, looking at the risk categories. So what of the criteria would be considered a risk before that patient is admitted to our facility. So you're looking at previous hospital admissions. So some, some of the hospitals have rewarded that over the course of time, and now they're saying previous admission to any type of healthcare facility. So that would include long-term care facilities. So some of them would say within the 12 months, in Canada, others will say outside of Canada included, of course, if you think of CPE. So there is different parameters that different hospitals will be uh, using to set this criteria. So it's not something that is universal, And um, but you, when you're asked a question and if you're consulting on this decision-making, this is what you're looking at, at. What are the risks and what are these contributing factors that could lead to colonization or infection of my patient. So has this patient been admitted to any hospital outside of Canada in past 12 months? Have they been living in communal living settings like long-term care group homes? Have they been in any prisons? So those are some of those uh, high-risk facilities that could potentially put your patient at risk to be positive for MRSA. Have they had previous history of either MRSA or VRE? So that's something that you may have information if that patient has been previously admitted to your hospital. Now with 
um, the integration of the charts that you can access through Connecting Ontario. And Linz are actually working on a deeper in interaction across GTA. So we will have more access. But at this point, if you know that, so say Leonard came to you from another facility and you never seen Leonard in your own facility, you can call. So say he came, Leonard came from Vernet, Vernet's facility and you just call Vernet and say, hi Vernet, you know, I have Leonard. Leonard's been with you guys for the last four years. Do you know what is his ARO status? Can you tell me what's going on? Has he tested positive? So if Burnett knows who you are, she will usually say yes or no. However, we have been called from random people asking random questions. So you don't want to share that information willy-nilly. Just so just always be very very cautious. Take down Burnett's or whoever is number that's calling you. So say Amandeep was calling Vernet. So Vernet, take down Amandeep's number and just call back that facility and call the switchboard and ask for IPAC. And when they connect you back to IPAC, you want to make sure that you're sharing that information with the right person. So you don't want to have someone from general public inquiring about ARO status of, of Leonard. Not that Leonard worries that he has MRSA, but it could be questions that actually may be more sensitive in nature. So you have to be kind of wise when you get these calls. <laughs> right, Martina? So we forget there is sometimes more than COVID. Unfortunately, that's the case. All right, so and then the, the risks of patients in, in ICU, it's of course because they're so sick, there are so many hands on care, but also they themselves are at higher risk of acquiring an infection, considering all the invasive lines that are there. So if they do have MRSA or VRE colonization or CPE colonization, they're of course at risk of getting that infection. So those are some of the criteria. So usually you will see in your facilities when the patient comes through triage or registration, they will ask them a bunch of these questions. And then immediately and automatically, a lot of facilities, as soon as you're entering ICU, they don't even ask any questions. They just swab you all along. They don't care. They just shove it up there. Oh my goodness, this. Okay, so for when we start collecting ARO swamps, you want to know where you're collecting them. So if it's MRSA, it is a nasal swab. However, you also want an, a rectal swab, or if your patient has a stoma of some kind, you want to collect that specimen from that site. The same goes for VRE as well. So what is interesting about VRE is also that the preferred specimen is stool. So normally you will find we tend to uh, collect uh, rectal swabs for VRE. However, when you are discontinuing precautions and most of most of the facilities will follow um, the the um, PIDAC recommendations in Ontario anyway, which tells you they have to be um, three negative swabs seven days apart. Usually most common is two minimum of two swabs and last specimen would be a stool specimen to clear that patient. And then of course, there is also the wound drainages for MRSA that are quite common. So you would be collecting that. When you start collecting any of these specimens, they, especially the wound drainage, you want to send that in, in, um, in a sterile clear transport container. So that's how that goes. And then when you're collecting, you want to go into the wound. You don't want to collect anything that is potentially contaminated or seeping off the edges of the wound, you want to go into that, into that center of the wound. So it may not be the most pleasant experience for your patient, but that's what you want to do. Sorry. And then, so when for your nasal swab, you're only collecting around the in, inside rim. It's not a nasopharyngeal swab where you're shoving that thick Q-tip type of MRSA swab or VRE um, up someone's nose. So you just want that uh, 
entrance area of of the nostril and then when you're collecting the rectal swab you always want to have a little bit of brown on that swab so I'm not sure what happened here. Things have shifted. But uh, when you are sending your specimens to the lab, make sure you provide as much information as you can to them because it's really important for them to know what are you sending so they can process that accordingly. And it's important for you to include this because um, quality of your decisions depends on the quality of information you receive from that lab and everything kind of falls into same process so you want to tell them what kind of if you're sending a wound swab you want to tell them what kind of swab it is where is it being collected from is it from the left buttock wound so you may have a patient that's completely ridden with with uh, wounds for whatever reason and you want to specify um, what is the particular location. When it comes to urine, you also want to be very clear that whether it's coming from a catheter or is it a midstream urine versus just urine. It makes a big difference when that result comes back, when um, whoever is interpreting that result, they need to know when. So when your results come back, your patient now at this point may change. It may have either that catheter removed or freshly inserted catheter. So you want to make sure that's very clear uh, at the time of the collection, what kind of specimens did you collect? So when you are, you're not collecting specimens, that's, there is no way in, in world that any time IPAC is going to be asked that they ask us, but we don't do it. So it has to be it has to be a nurse. It has to be a licensed professional who is collecting, who is entering any of the of the body cavities. So for me, being a public health inspector, I can't collect specimens from the patients, although I do promise the nurses I will be collecting some of the swabs from them just to keep everyone in line. But um, truly, I can't do any of that. So when you're sending your specimens, you want to make sure that these specimens are processed as soon as possible. Most of the new hospitals have a tube system and it just goes into the, into the magic of tube systems. Um, I've seen in older hospitals or where the, where the, when the tube systems are down, they utilize porters to come and pick it up. So usually they would put a little basket on the nursing station with all the requisitions and the, usually the clerk, when she sees there is a certain amount of specimens, she calls the porters and say, come and pick it up. We have specimens for you. So it's never going to be your role to carry any specimens. Um, we have been asked to carry Ebola specimens and some, some of those things, but it's better, the best is to have a process in place to, to manage the specimens in the proper way. So don't store them in refrigerators, it's definitely not in the free refrigerators that are used for food storage. So if you have a, there is Sharon's sandwich, she does not want that stool or urine specimen next to it. I tell you, that lady is already grossed out with everything we are sharing here in this class. She doesn't need those specimens next to her food. So I already said the quality of your reports is that directly proportionate to quality of specimen. <laughs> Leonard. <laughs> um, and uh, it's important that all the accurate information is accompanying your specimen. So on your requisitions, you want to have the patient's name, the hospital number, uh, the time, the date of birth, of course, all, all the demographics that follow that, that patient, but you also want to put in the, the date and the time that specimen has been collected. So when that comes down there, they actually can include all that information when they're processing specimens. If you don't know what kind of container you need, or if you don't know what what kind of specimen is required for a particular test, so sometimes you will find uh, the physicians will order 
particular type of test and you're just wondering what am I supposed to send for this test so just call the lab they know they will tell you right away what kind of and sometimes you will also find you don't have this these the, the particular containers on on your unit because they're either unique so I can think of um, MP swabs have been quite um, quite a thing with COVID so they were not available more than a couple on the unit so you have to call the lab to ship you some upstairs or wherever they're located. Um, other thing is the, the the spit and swish containers, swish and spit containers. So that's for the patients who can't handle any more being swabbed or refuse or for whatever reason. So those are some of those unique containers that may not be avail readily available. So just call them. They have it. They can send it to you. So the other types of specimens besides the ARO swabs, you can also be looking at into your skin specimens. So that would be either swabs, but also could be when we are talking about scabies, when you're doing the skin scraping. So that's another thing that you may encounter as a, as a specimen. So when you receive a result, that's what you will find. Uh, GI tract, of course. So if you're suspecting any, so one of the things or the pen, so I should actually mention this to you. Um, in some places, the um, physicians, usually the infectious diseases physicians will um, create a directive for the IPAC team that we actually, in fact, can be ordering some of these specimens. So usually you can get a medical directive for ARO swabs, for MP swabs, and stool collection. I've never seen um, any of the TB testing being given directive to IPAC practitioners. Um, we can order a stool for culture, C. diff, and ovine parasites, and that depends from a facility to facility. You have to make sure when uh, you are in your role that you read your policies and procedures and look out for those directives. So directives are written documents. They usually sit somewhere on a shared drive. Your colleagues should know. Um, also, whether we have given that right under the medical directive of our medical directors of the IPAC teams. So generally speaking, all of these uh, invasive swabs, they are ordered by physicians and sometimes nurses also have a medical directive to collect these swabs based on the symptomatology and presentation of the patients. So we as IPAC, most, most often um, aero swabs, stool, and sometimes MP swabs depending on the facility. I think I just answered your questions. <laughs> so it's it's always under the medical directive. So we don't, as IPAC practitioners, we, unless there is a directive, we never have just a go at, at a swab, at ordering swab. So there always have to be a directive under your infectious diseases physician. Or you can ask, yeah. So other thing is, so if you see that patient has a number of stools and there were times when I didn't work in a facility where I didn't have a directive, I would call a nurse of that patient. So I would say, hey, Sharon, Leonard has four diarrheas today. Um, can you please collect a specimen for? So then she would say, is that an order? And you say, no, um, just, just a suggestion. And then she would say, sure, no problem. I will call Dr. Marina and Dr. Marina will okay it. So they have to get a verbal from them. Yeah, so we usually make recommendations. That's most common, but um, as, as part of ordering piece, you may have been exposed to a facility where we have um, the medical directives that we operate under. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely right. All right, so then when it comes to your 
respiratory tract, usually that includes either a nasopharyngeal swab or sputum collection, but also can be a throat or mouth swab. So uh, for your group A strep, for example, would be a throat swab. For MP swabs are, of course, you guys know for COVID, flu, and any really any other respiratory symptoms that um, that we are suspecting during the flu season and could be anywhere depending on a facility depending on the lab you will find anywhere from minimum 7 11 sometimes 19 different viruses that are tested during the uh, flu season and then for urinary tract you are collecting urine of course it could be either midstream urine or catheter urine or it could be a suprapubic aspirate and those are different types of urine specimens that we send and then for eyes and ears it swabs usually and could be also um could be also an aspirate from the ear fluid but also could be corneal scrapings depending on what are we looking for so your urine specimens, as I said, uh, it has to be either a midstream urine, so you want to uh, remove all the potential contaminants, or it's a catheter specimen. So if your patient is catheterized, you don't collect from the bag, you collect from the catheter, actually. When, um, if it's um, in and out, you also want to make sure you document that. There is an expectation to clean the area prior to inserting, collecting the specimen, and make sure it's clearly documented on the requisition what type of specimen. Of course, time. You also want to make sure that you document if the patient has been on antibiotics and how long. And um, any of this information will help them really process the specimen and have a better understanding themselves, and then they can support you better. So all the, all the specimens should be collected in the dry or sterile containers. And the same thing I already mentioned. So always collect your from the um, when your patient is, has a foley in, it's from the tubing, don't collect from the bag. And the reason for it is urine will start growing bacteria just because it's, it's a really good, um, it's a good ground for growth. And your urine can be colonized. We had discussed this in the past that quite frequently, especially as our population ages as we, us as people age due to ana anatomical changes, you will find that urine can be quite frequently colonized. So it's critical that we are collecting these specimens in, 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 in the right way. Also worth mentioning, you will may be asked how to do these collections and specimens. If you are doing an in-service, always invite your educators. So those are the nurse educators. They are employed in the hospitals and they're the ones who are responsible to train the nurses. So don't do this on your own unless you are absolutely in, in, a, in, in a position that there is no one else. And if that's the case, invite a unit manager in that situation because again, it is it is a fine line when we start educating nurses, us as IPAC, in, in something like specimen collection. So you can provide information, but you want to make sure that there is a nurse as, besides you to support you in delivering this information. So uh, if in, Sharon, to answer your question, um, for anyone really that has, it's not for IPAC to set up a diagnosis. So I would definitely call a physician and, re and have a conversation with that physician and say, you know what, this is the situation. I don't know where is this yellow secretion coming from. It could be an infectious process. It, it may not. It could be also that you have someone who has maybe something lodged in their in their um, airways. So you will have somebody maybe who has aspirated. And so you want a physician to also not only order clinical specimens, but you may want to ask for a chest x-ray. And we definitely can't order chest x-rays. So have a conversation with a physician and also someone needs to take a look at that patient to see what, what is going on from the clinical perspective. 
So when we start looking into the next way of uh, collecting specimens, it could be bed pens. So sometimes you will find that um, our patients cannot produce a specimen in such fashion that we can collect it anywhere else, but it has to be from a bed pen. And it's really important to know that these bed pens are, are quite contaminated. So when you're collecting from it, you want to use um, a syringe to collect that. Uh, if it's urine, but also um, if you're collecting something like stool, you also want to make sure that this is no mixing with urine. So sometimes it's really challenging with patients who are cognitively um, impaired and they don't understand. So sometimes some of these specimens are really, really really challenging you you have a really good point there so again the hygiene bag but without the um, the liner so without the gel substance you uh, put it after so once you put the bag in definitely you can use it but also when you send it document on that requisition sheet because th these bags are not sterile not that it matters for so much for for a stool but if that happens that you ended up collecting uh, urine that way you want to make sure that you document that's being collected from a bed pan so how does your specimen look in, in a laboratory setting and how what happens actually once you send it. Usually what they do is they collect your your urine, your patient's urine rather, and then they start looking into the processing and plating it on agar plate. So on the right hand side you will see there is this like fields and that's how they count the um the numbers of colonies, right? So you will see what is significant number of bacteria that are they're already preset. So for catheter, anything that is uh, over 10,000 uh, colonies per milliliter, or uh, for the midstream urine, anything that is over 100,000 of uh, milliliters per urine. Uh, so you can find multiple organisms and depending on the lab really so certain labs will process or not but in most cases if you, they find more than three organisms three or more they will consider this specimen contaminated so i'm just going to tell you that this may be on your cic exam the part about contaminated specimens so they will tell you um it, your urine specimen came back and it has E. coli and has Klebnumo, has Citrobacter frondi, has Galorobacteria. And it's not something to start panicking, thinking, oh my goodness, what my patient has. It's rather to consider that it could be a contaminated specimen. If it's less than three different microorganisms, they will work it up. Again, depends on the lab, and you have to give them a call to figure out what is a cutoff for them, if that's of any importance to you. I think it's more relevant in patient population that is uh, relevant to long-term care facilities than in acute care settings. We don't really we, we don't really have so much concern with resending the specimens, and we know it's a different patient population. So if we see anything more than three specimens that are recognized or submitted, we re always resubmit your specimens. So for your stool collection, of course, so you may recognize some of these containers and they may vary from lab to lab. In my experience, they all look, wherever I've been, they're all the same. You have the little orange tops that we send for C. diff and viral cultures. And then the green tops are we sending for culture and sensitivity. And then the ova and parasite are yellow and, and white tops. So couple of things it's important to to know i find um people think more is more more is not always better <laughs> more, is, more is sometimes too much so um the stool will actually create gas so if 
you overload that container, he, um, the your lab person opening that up may find themselves in a, in a very uncomfortable situation where that uh, container completely bursts and no one wants that. So as people don't want these specimens in their fridges, they don't want these specimens bursting into their face. So don't over overfill the containers. There you go, Anita had experience. <laughs> First hand experience. <laughs> yeah, um, so I will also tell you my fake specimens that I made um, with, um, with chocolate. I had one also that <laughs> exploded. So it was better, it was just chocolate, but still I was still confused what caused the gas in my fake, in my fake stool. Yeah, so people, as, as I said, people always think sending more is better. It's like they really don't need that much. They need only like a, a raisin size for for stool specimen. Um, so they don't need that much of um, that much of a specimen. Yeah. Yeah, so the line is still not like go all, all, all the way. That's the max, right? So it's still not telling you to, to fill it all the way to the brim and then screw that top right back on and hope for the best. <laughs> so when, um, oh my God, Leonard. So when we are collecting these stool specimens, what are the triggers, right? So when you're looking at your patient presentation, you are looking at patients who have loose stool in 24 hour period, or uh, if it's related to any of the risk associated for acquiring um, any of the um, diseases that do present with diarrhea. So could it be that they had um, food consumption from either home or cafeteria, or uh, have they traveled in the past month? Have they had a known contact with another person? Contact with animals, like petting zoos are a really big big deal with, with um, outbreaks in daycares. So the kids I go and um, pet, turtles and sheep and goat and kiss the little piggies and whatnot. So those are some of the, um, the um, those are some of the, the causes for, for diarrhea and of course the reasons why you would send a specimen. I'm sorry, I'm reading Leonard's comment and I, can, <laughs> I cannot take my eyes off what he's saying. Um, so what is important, of course, we already have pretty much killed this topic. Do not overfill your containers. Make sure the labels are, the specimens are properly labeled. I would also advise you, you label your specimens before you bring, you put um, uh, the actual specimen into the container. So pr properly label the container, I should say rather. And then always make sure whatever you're sending, th those containers go into the biohazard bag. And your biohazard bags usually have at the back a little pocket where you um, include the requisition. So, yeah, that's actually very interesting because when I used to work in the OR, they wanted us to label it before. Yeah, so label it before. Oh, well, sorry, you said before. Okay, okay. Sorry. Yeah, you don't want to label it after because it's at this point the container is contaminated, right? So always label it before. Did I say after? I apologize if I said that, but always no, make sure. I'm wrong. I heard wrong, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I, I do say things sometimes that are backwards, so I apologize, but label your container before you put a specimen in. Yeah, it's. I think we're all, all tired today. And then when you're sending your stool specimen, uh, don't mix it with with um, with urine. So they're just gonna be discarding that. I know sometimes nurses would say, "I am so sure my patient has has C diff because it smells like C diff." Yet they're producing a formed stool. And they want to test it, and the labs will reject 
a foreign stool or anything that is not taking a shape of container. So they add either water or urine and well, those lab people are not stupid. They know what they're dealing with once they open those exploding containers, they know what's happening. So stool for C. diff, of course. So it must be liquid. It must take a shape of container. Um, and there is different types of tests that they're gonna be doing. So depending on the lab, uh, you may end up with either uh, toxin being tested, this will be tested for the toxins or the PCR test. Um, and then when you receive a report back, so you will find they will tell you it's positive for the toxin or they will tell you it's a PCR test. So you will know what your lab does. Sometimes if they get either overwhelmed with number of tests, like I know I find sometimes the result comes back and I'm reading it's like, huh, that's not done by our lab. This is a different type of test. So you kind of get comfortable with reading your results and recognizing what your lab does and what your lab will actually send outside if they can't handle the specimens so you recognize the reports are not what you're used to. So toxins are only present if organism is present. So that's what's really, really important for you to know. So toxin cannot be in the stool without the actual microorganism. So I'm going to ask you, there's a picture here. So um, I actually had someone made a cake once with um, the the, the stools, the little specimens, and um, of course we IPAC people got all excited about our bristle stool chart. <laughs> so which ones of these would you send for testing on that um, are the different types? I always think of type one as those like grazing covered chocolates. <laughs> I don't know. And then type two is kind of like, oh, Henry. Oh, stop it. I love old Henry. Stop. <laughs> don't let me not like my chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon is like, I'm done wrapping up, closing my computer. I'm done with the class. I will still eat it. I don't care. I'll still eat my chocolate. I don't care. Oh, I know. I know you don't get so easily phased out, but Sharon has a really weak stomach. <laughs> So I would say uh, anything that would take a shape of container, right? So sometimes you will find something um, that is kind of sticking to the sides of the container and it doesn't slide down. But some of those specimens will be also very slimy and kind of gelatinous in, in presence. So you want to send those. And um, with, with C. diff, you will find quite frequently a lot of mucus that comes with the stool. So people are not always sure unless it's like liquid, like running water. It doesn't necessarily need to be that liquid. -ed. It just has to take a shape of container. So when you collect that stool and if it does settle on the bottom, just send that. And bottom line is if you send something that's not appropriate, those lab people, they know what they're dealing with. If they find a specimen that they're not approving of, they will just discard it and email you or send in that rep lab report um, specimen discarded st stool formed or something to that extent. So when we send the stool, stool specimens for, to be tested for C. diff, you, sometimes you will find it is you will receive both, but most of the time we only see one result and it is, um, I don't know what's going on with this. Like I think that things have just moved around here on my chart, on my screen. Oh, sorry. So this, it's two step for, for the lab. You will find that um, they do the screening and confirmatory test. And so the, 
you will see also the sensitivity and specificity. Okay, so let me stop here and I'm going to tell you something. You, for your CIC exam, you have to be able to distinguish the difference between the sensitivity of a test and the specificity of test. So it doesn't matter what kind of test it is, this is going to be an interesting, um, you may get a question or two in figuring out what's the specificity and what's the sensitivity and which one do you prefer. So um, when you get your C diff test results rather, um, as I said, they will also do a confirmatory test for the toxin gene, and that's with this LAMP test. So sometimes you, when you get your test, you will see it says test completed by LAMP. It's not actual light bulb. It's just a, a loop mediated DNA amplification. So it's it's another, it's kind of like, I would say it's similar to PCR testing. It amplifies the DNA, replicates it. So they're looking into, into um, that. It's a high quality test. So when you're looking into the sensitivity, it is that particular test is, is highly sensitive and, and has really good sensitivity. With your toxicity, when you're looking into your toxins of, of the test, look how high specificity is in that test. So it's, it's very good to tell you whether it's a true positive test. So now you get your lab report, it comes back. You, after all that stool we sent and you can do a little happy dance, you see that your result is actually going to tell you what your patient has and what your patient doesn't have. Kind of exciting time. Yeah, so I noticed that things do shift and my texts go under the, the pictures and I, I'm a little bit confused with what happens, but um, the uh, PDF versions are uploaded as well, so you can access that and should, shouldn't, shouldn't be anything different than what is original file created. No class tomorrow. No, tomorrow you just sit back, relax, and think about all the good stuff that we learned today. So negative report will always tell you that, if it's negative, it will tell you negative for with, or did not detect Salmonella, Shigella, Yersinia, Campy, or none of that is isolated. So that's how it simply reads. And if it's positive for something, it will tell you positive, it's positive for Salmonella. And then if you're looking into sensitivities, I will tell you all the labs are running sensitivities, but you have to ask them to send them to you. Oh, <laughs> did you guys forget about that outbreak that was related to raspberries? I know Marina enjoyed it. I'm sure Sharon is like, yeah, no, I'm not reading any of that stuff. So, and then when you want to find out about the sensitivities, just give them a call and they will either push it to you, email it to you, or sometimes in some systems, you actually can run these reports yourself. Uh, pathogens that are requiring treatment are always going to have a susceptibility test. So if you're looking into say, um, salmonella that may be resistant, they will always push out a report and it's going to be there immediately. So for some that do not require a treatment, then there are self-limiting diseases. If you're curious, you have to call them, but for the ones that do need to be treated, they will have um, a susceptibility at the bottom of the report. So your ovum parasites, I cannot tell you that I've seen anything too exotic in my life, although I was so uh, always looking forward to find some of the f fancy parasites, never found anything in, in any of the soil specimens, sadly. Um, but um, also it's important that you're collecting these in the appropriate specimen because it's a specimen container rather it's important because they all come with media and when you are sending the specimens you don't want to send the wrong one because they can't process it um, 
For a parasite testing, it's absolutely critical for the lab to know whether that patient had any uh, travel history, in particular, any travel history. If you have something uh, in mind and you're thinking this could be endemic to this country or endemic to that country, or they may have traveled to uh, Caribbean and they're coming back and now they have diarrhea, just put that in. They want to know. Leonard, how does one accidentally grow <laughs> anthrax? I'm sorry, how did you accidentally gr grow anthrax? <laughs> um, so, oh my gosh, I'm dying now. Parasites are, um, they, they're also reportable. So you have to make sure that when you identify, especially some of those parasites that are endemic to certain countries and not commonly found in Canada, you have to call the public health unit to let them know. Um, and uh, there is no, a little bit of parasite type of thing. You have a parasite, it's, it's significant information. Um, yeah, I know we need Leonard here. Like Leonard, we have we have few enemies to take care of. <laughs> um, so your viral cultures, when you're sending your stool specimens for viral cult cultures, rather, also requires a special transport media. So make sure you call the lab and let them know you're collecting. So you want to make sure they know what what needs to be, uh, how to process these specimens. If you are experiencing any type of outbreak on, on in your facility, usually uh, we don't ask public health to provide us with specimen containers. However, if it's something unique and they want these specimens sent to a particular lab and this lab needs these containers, they're gonna pr produce that for you. More so important, this reflects to community settings or maybe, for smaller facilities where you don't have all the specimens container specimen containers available, so your public health public health unit can provide this for you. I want a picture of this little oh, lab on a balcony. Oh, that is so cute. There is hope for us. There is kids that like to clean their hands and all follow all the good procedures like Burnett's grandson and Marina's kid that is uh, doing his lab. Obviously he's not that, that young, but um, I still want to see the lab. <laughs> oh, it's adorable. Oh my God, you're gonna get in trouble. Just don't put him in touch with Leonard. Leonard grows accidentally anthrax. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, so when we are collecting throat swabs, usually the most common swab that is collected is for group A strep. Um, and it's you can see how you have to, again, not IPAC business, but you just need to know how it's done. Um, when you send, a specimen when you receive a result usually there is no susceptibility report um, but it will tell you whether there is presence or absence of group a strep when uh, you are to collect that specimen you want to use a tongue depressor push the tongue down and then swipe uh, around the uvula and between the tonsils so um, you know all the gagging things so that people don't like that. And I will tell you, do not stand in front of them when you're collecting these swabs, be to the side. And if you are there and observing someone, just be to the side because I've seen stuff fly out of people's mouth when you tickle their uvula. Your nasopharyngeal swabs, I'm absolutely positive everyone is a expert now in collection of MP swabs. So you want to make sure, so there's different swabs, of course, depending on the lab that, and then we have experienced through the shortage 
uh, over the past two years, all sorts of swabs come through our facility. And um, we have been using also culture swabs, the ones that you would normally use for MRSA and VRE. Sadly, whoever had to get that shoved up all the way um, back. But what's important when we are um, collecting these swabs, you're looking in into your patient and you kind of make this rock and roll sign and then you're looking from the tip of the nose to the ear that's in the right in the middle is where you want that swab to get so um, no you will not collect the brain matter if you do we have a bigger problem on our hands so you want your patient to tip their head so when you enter that swab it's actually entering straight in so you're not digging in and it should not be a long process so you should only have a couple of seconds that swab in that area so it's actually in this in the sinuses so you should feel some resistance because what what happens is you're entering in between the tissue so you want to have some resistance there make sure um the, the specimen is properly labeled you're sending a requisition with your patient's name date of birth date of collection and um so depending on, um, so here's important piece. If you are in an outbreak, you want to include that outbreak number so the lab can easily process that specimen and it gets included in your outbreak report. Um, and also does expedite testing for you. If, um, if there is no part of outbreak, always make sure you include the, of course, the health card number. If, you are, uh, if your patient has a chart number, you include that as well. It is aseptic procedure, it's not a sterile procedure, so you always want to make sure you're cleaning your hands before you're collecting these specimens. And when you are done, these, these swabs have really, really long tips, so, and the actual vial, you have to break it off so you put your swab back into the vial and break it at the at the edge of the container the those two go into biohazard bag and send to the lab what is important to know that uh, actually these swabs have a shelf life so they cannot stay long um out without be before you process them so um Last year, May, June, um, we were so overwhelmed and the public health lab was so overwhelmed with that there was a significant amount of specimens that actually went um, bad, so to speak. So they were considered no longer viable. So we had to re-swab our patients. We had to call some of those patients that were um, in the community from the community they weren't admitted so they were in our assessment centers so we had to call them back to come and get re-swab because the swabs just uh, stayed too long outside the, the labs did not have capacity to process as many swabs back then things have changed a lot of hospitals are running their own swabs and all these um, third-party hospitals uh, third-party labs rather are running their own COVID swabs now However, we want to make sure they are not um, too in, stored in, in a too warm environment. So you want to put them on ice packs. They're going in, in the cooling containers to the lab. So usually they come, the, um, the purolators come on regular days, three to four times a day. And then on weekends, you will have two times a day. And why is that important to us? So it's not really that we care so much about when they're coming or not, but if you have an outbreak and you're doing a point prevalence on your units, so you want to make sure that your specimens are going out with the first pure later, with the first um, uh, shipment out of the facility. So it gives you that entire day uh, to get the results back. And also if you're, when you're looking into declaring outbreaks over, you want the least possible amount of time spent waiting. So you want to send your specimens early morning. So I, as I said, I don't know how, what's what is 
the, the shelf life. I know that some of those specimens have gone bad after that we learn like a week later, but I don't know what's the shelf life actually. I can find out that for you and get back to you to see what is, how long would they keep them viable. Marina, you're killing me. <laughs> I think everyone will get disoriented if you shove that stuff in their nose. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I will find out about the shelf life. Okay, so this was just supposed to show you a different type of specimen. It's also used for viral collection. So this is a deep nasal specimen. So if you guys have seen those memes where they're showing um, a nurse collecting, putting a swab in somebody's nose and then into into the, the throat right after. So those are your deep, deep nasal specimens, and they're usually followed by a throat specimen. Yeah, so um, I don't know that I want anything to be actually following each other in this sequence, but that's how it's done. So they want uh, you you collect it. It doesn't go all that way into the sinuses, so you just go into this um, a deep nasal area. Versus so you can use actually the same culture swab. So it's um, so if you're looking into your MRSA swab that just goes around inside of the of your nasal rim, and then your nasopharyngeal swab kind of ends up in in the middle of a cheek, so to speak. So this would be kind of in between those two. Yeah, I think they have to be processed within the 72 hours, but I don't know what's what's the, the, the definite cutoff when how long would um, that be considered viable. So I think it may be also different from a lab to lab, depending on their quality assurance and how are they processing, but I will find out the details for you. Sputum collection. So this is usually done most commonly for when we are suspecting TB, but um, it could be through either sputum where you are, where your patient is coughing up that deep cough. It could be a tracheal aspirate or bronchial lavage, and also could be esophageal brushing. So. Sometimes you will find also lung tissue. I've seen it. It's not quite common. Most common is sputum. It's less invasive. It's the easiest. And then the next one I would say would be your um, the the BAL bowel or bronchial bronchial lavage. So that's what I would say I found most in the in the uh, in my experience. Uh, as I said, it is most commonly done for TB, and um, it's there is standards with regards to the specimen collection. So uh, they don't want the pooled specimens. So if you are putting specimens together from different attempts, don't send that. So um, anything that contains saliva. So this is also, I will just make a brief point here. This also may be on your exam. So, um, sputum specimens that contain 10 or more epithelial cells are considered contaminated and uh, they will not be testing that for TB. So that means that your patient did not produce that deep sputum, so it's contaminated with saliva and they don't want to test that. So make sure um, that there is no saliva in, in your sputum specimens. So also specimens that will be um, rejected are the ones that you send in formalin. I can't really see why would anyone do that, but it's probably by accident. And um, don't send the endotracheal tubes <laughs> to them. They don't need that either. So usually for testing for TB, we are looking into three sputum specimens and um, standard Vary. So this is really interesting to know this. So it is standard is minimum 24 hours apart. You want that first morning sputum to be collected and before breakfast. So before your patient eats or drinks anything, this is what you want to collect. Um, so then the TB standards 
I think I want to show you this too. Hold on. So I have posted the link for this particular document. There is um, the TB standards that are accessible for free for us. It is, um, po it's out there for you to read and be comfortable with information out there. It addresses various aspects of TB, but also speaks about the student collection. And I will post it again in this session. Um, what is interesting about this is that we'll tell you in one place and we were all very confused when this change came about because we are so used to these three specimens uh, 24 hours apart that came out that a minimum could be also one hour apart. Uh, and so when we had a discussion with our infectious diseases physician back then, he actually told us it's with idea of serving patients that are in community and not admitted into hospitals. So they don't have to come three days in a row for spe for sputum collection. So they are permitted to come in and then have uh, three sputums minimum hour apart. So that's how these new standards were, were addressing the, um, the sputum collection. When you follow up, if your patient has been now identified and treated for TB, you want again to submit three different specimens after minimum of two months of treatment. And you want to make sure your patient actually is showing signs and improvements of um, clinical signs and improvements. Where you run into problems is that sometimes our patients are so, so sick that they can't handle the medication. So we put um, medication on hold to allow for liver and kidneys to regenerate. So you have to have then a conversation with your ID doc and decide on when they consider this patient to be, um, again, good to go, so to speak, ready to be tested. So I had patients that were positive for TB and they were on and off and on and off on medication. And um, one of my patients actually has sadly passed away. And every time we would test him, we will get one positive, one negative. So we never managed to clear him off precautions, of course, but he was constantly being taken off medication because he was his, his liver couldn't handle it anymore. So of course, you, well, you know, you would have to not have breakfast. So I guess it would be fasting, consider fasting because you want that. Um, because once you start bringing food in, you're producing more saliva, right? So you want to make sure there is no food um, involved or drinking. So it's hard, of course, for patients that are outpatients and they need to produce this. That said, um, also depending on all, all public health units do have TB program and all public health units do support patients in communities. Um, but there is health units that have huge communities that are affected with TB and they have amazing TB program. So I can think of York region and Toronto and some of our northern Toronto, uh, Ontario communities that have amazingly developed TB programs and they would go out to these patients and collect specimens so they wouldn't have to come in. But again, that is not written across the board. It's not uniform. It depends on the health unit to health unit. So pretty much the same goes. You always want to make sure that you're collecting enough, not too, not too much, of course, but not too little. This is not um, to, to also to be sent in, in um, your sterile container. So don't send it in, in containers that are not sterile or you're suspecting the sterility. If the seals have been broken, use a sterile container. So you don't want to put your patients um, 
you don't want to put your patients in in a situation that they have to go or come back for for these specimens again. And then, of course, any bronchial brushings or lung biopsies, they also go into sterile containers, and that's the sterile saline solution. Anytime, anytime there's any question and you don't know the answer, call the lab. They know what to do. They know how to process. Then the most important thing is don't, don't freeze these specimens. So in, in, um, in the hospitals, we don't really worry so much about sending specimens. And um, yeah, really, where is our poo emoji? We were talking about that too earlier. So um, it's important that we send the specimens as soon as possible down to the lab. I think for a freezing comment is probably more related to facilities that don't have lab on site and you're concerned that your specimen may go bad. So don't freeze it. You can refrigerate it, but don't freeze it. So this here's a, a what we call a um, e-swab. So there's are these two uh, actual swabs in one container. That's what we had across the board before COVID. It was quite commonly used, and then these ended up also being used for COVID swabs. So um, these are recommended for MRSA, VRE, and CPE. So when you are using um, your interior near, collecting from interior nares or perineal area, and also for any skin lesions, including wounds and incisions. And um, it is recommended for VRE and stool and rectal swabs and colostomy. So when you're collecting your MRSA swabs, make sure that you pre-moisten the specimen. So use either a sterile solution or the media that is already in that vial. So you can, and you collect from both nostrils. So um, that's a question that we are quite often asked. Do we collect just one or two? Collect from both. And you do a little circular motion when you're collecting it. When you're collecting the wounds, you again, make sure you are collecting from the center of the wound. You're not collecting anything that's potentially contaminated. And uh, the same thing goes for your any sites of indwelling devices. So if your patients have any uh, lines, so you always want to make sure that you are swabbing those exit sites of these indwelling devices and never use the same swab because there is a potential that you can spread the colonization, and especially in cases of open wounds or um, indwelling devices causing actual infection and we don't want that. So VRE, very similar, it's the same specimen. You will see that for VRE or CPE, where we are only collecting the, um, the uh, rectal swab, you will find there is only one stick. So it's not different, it's all the same thing. It's just what they're trying to help us in the process and use less plastic when we have the e-dual swabs. So it's more or less the same thing. Again, make sure it's pre-moistened and then you want to um, go in and get a little bit of visible stool on those swabs, or as we like to say, a little bit of brown on it. So here is a, an image of wound collection. So if you imagine that you have these deep wounds, you want to go under. So you don't want to collect anything around here where it's definitely contaminated. So don't um, collect anything that is um, leaking outside of the wound. So that's definitely going to have some contamination from the skin. So you want to make sure you find the cleanest access area in the wound and then put that swab in, rotate again, and if if the wounds have tunneling, uh, you want to collect that. Um, it is it is quite unfortunate. We do have patients that have wounds that are so far gone that do have tunneling present, but um, usually, again, it's not something that we as IPAC do, but this is something we need to know when, when we are asked these questions. So um, for MERS, we had discussion over this past week, what are we collecting for, has anyone dealt with MRS, uh, with MERS or SARS or COVID and Ebola? So I'm just going to show you what um, we were actually asked during the MERS um, 
scare and outbreaks that were happening in Middle East. And when uh, when we were seeing MERS coming into Canada is usually after and during Hajj. So people who live in Canada, we are um, an immigrant country. So people tend to travel and it is not something that we have in, in Canada. MERS is not something that we have homegrown. So it is, uh, as you guys know, it is transmitted via camels. So there is some documentation of human to human, usually in those direct and close interactions between the healthcare worker and a patient. But when we were seeing patients that were suspected for MERS, these are the things that we had to ask. So we had to collect uh, MP swabs and uh, also throat swabs were asked for and blood cultures, urine. And so blood was collected for serology and then blood was also collected for the PCR testing. We were also asked to collect stool as well. And um, the the BAL. These patients always go on airborne droplet contact precautions. They are accommodated in single rooms, so negative pressure, and everybody uh, taking care of these patients is to wear N95 respirators that are fit tested and seal checked, eye protection, gloves, and gowns. And when it comes to room cleaning, just a regular cleaning, there is no sporocidal in use for this particular um, cleanup of the room. So for Ebola, I don't know if you guys, uh, I know that we discussed this, but um, we had so many different directions and so many different uh, ways of being advised to what to collect and what not to collect. But um, Ebola is something that you will never have tested in your own facility. So you always will have to work with PHO lab, give them, give them a call, let them know that you are to submit the test, that you have a suspect patient. And so they need to know whether that patient has met the criteria. Usually patients that present to us have recent history of travel to endemic countries and that recent means within the 21 day they either also could have had um, contact known contact with um, with um, another person who has tested positive for Ebola what they do is a PCR test and this is what is actually processed in Winnipeg so I think I mentioned at the beginning how we have organized entire chain of, trans of transport. It's really important that you know what countries are affected. And uh, so I put here a website, I put it also on our webpage, uh, the travel health notices. So always go and check what countries are on, on the alert and where are the the hot zones. It could be Ebola, it could be uh, any other diseases of concern. And uh, so always check that so you know to share that with your triage and registration staff. And that's more applicable to your hospital settings than in a long-term care settings. I really can't see anyone presenting at a long-term care saying, hey, you know what? I just came from uh, Ebola affected country and I'm here to, to see you guys. That usually doesn't, doesn't happen like that. So it's interesting also for you guys to know every time we are testing for Ebola, we also are testing for malaria. So that's kind of a process. And um, always, always follow your emergency uh, response plan. So that's something that we have usually in our facilities. I put here an example for you. It's a fan out list. So um, this is one of the fan out lists that we use in one of my facilities. So uh, it helps people because you get absolutely panicked when someone shows up at your door and people, although they know the answers, as we just saw that with with Sharon just completely blocking, blacking out after we ask the questions. She knows the answers, but can't think properly, can't think straight. So that's what happens with, with triage when they have a patient that presents and they f answer all the, all the questions, they just start panicking. Although they're usually cool, cool, calm and collected and very, very um, versed dealing with a lot of these high stress situations. But um, 
just to help them everyone deal with with the process we laminated these fan out lists and kept them on on their at the triage desk so they knew who to call and how this actually works out who is responsible who to involve who needs to be there so you can see that um, the charge nurse was always responsible to call us and then we were calling the call center and security so we take away some of these responsibilities um then also the the charge nurse in, in emerge they would of course call the inform the patient's nurse inform the registration call the uh, our ED physicians and lab. And we also, as IPAC on call, because usually you get um, IPAC on call through these, through these fan out lists, we inform our ID doc and the rest of our team and the risk and so on and so forth. Okay. So this is just, just for you to see, nothing to, to, to stress about. You will not be implementing any Ebola fan out list for, the, for any of these exams coming up. So when you are collecting your specimens, so this is important to know. So you have to know the process of for the um, for uh, Ebola scenario. So always pre-label the collection kit. Make sure you collect enough uh, that you have enough dedicated tubes. So when you're going to collect specimens, you're not going back and forth because you can't. Once you're in that room, we lock the door and we are not letting you out until you get what we needed. Um, also. The process is to wipe down everything as you're leaving the room. So you will be wiping down the container, wiping down the outside surfaces of each tube with Clorox wipes in this case was for us, but it's any, actually any, any uh, sporocidal will do. And also we ask to remove the outer layer of gloves and then place each specimen into separate sealable plastic biohazard. And then again, wipe out that bag with the Clorox and it could be again, any sporocidal, it will do. And then we take these um, specimens into anti room and place them in, in uh, durable container. So you would get another container from the lab and they usually are plastic with a twist top and you can transport that. So this is just another example that we used and we distributed it to our, our frontline staff. And I can tell you, we had so many different ways and directives to who collects the specimen. It's a nurse, it's the lab, it's a physician. So it was always every couple of days, there was a new directive coming to us. And was, it, it was just as equally confusing as it, was, as it is with COVID, how many different instructions you get from different agencies in a way how to handle these specimens. So when we collect our uh, collect our specimens, always make sure that you complete your risk assessment. Uh, always make sure you complete the hand hygiene before and after handling any of the blood and body subst substances, wear proper PPE, follow the procedure of each specimen collection, collect the specimen with the recommendations that are provided to you in accordance to particular specimens. So it could be, it, it will be different from specimen to specimen. Label your containers properly, make sure that all the specimens are going down with exactly the same name of your patient. The labels that are produced belong to that patient, so we're not sending someone else's um, name, which also has happened in the past. And uh, it happened, so we had two patients with same name and somehow when the labels got printed, they were printing labels at the same time for two different patients, but it ended up that they were with the same name. It was, the patients were not on the same, nowhere near each other on the unit. However, when the nurse came, she collected, she looked at the name, picked up, and put on, on her patient. It was exactly the same name of her patient. But, um, and then the same thing happened with the other patient, another nurse. And when, when, it pro when the specimen got to the lab, when they're actually looking at the barcodes and comparing the barcodes, it was evident that things were not matching. So be careful when you're looking at collect uh, uh, submitting specimens that you double check always. I know, shocking, <laughs> but we, you know, it's all good. Lab caught it, so there's always there is always so many cheese 
Swiss cheese layers for us to go through. It was un unfortunate for the for the patients because both of them had to come back and be retested. But so things do happen. Sometimes it's human to to make mistakes. And again, make always sure you put your um, label your specimens in biohazard bag and seal that bag. No one wants stuff leaking around. And um, as I said, make sure you put your requisition in there and the the specimens are usually viable for 48 hours, but I will follow up on that for COVID in particular. So from the occupational exposures, we will get involved. However, it's always an occupational health department. And for the purpose of CIC exam, you need to know the aspects of occupational health. But for your day-to-day -day work, if you're working in, in uh, acute care settings or even some larger uh, long-term care settings, it's not part of our portfolio to follow up with the staff. So. Whenever there is any risk of exposure, you always want to make sure that staff is comfortable to go seek medical assistance and report this. So it, these any types of exposure or injuries have to be reported to occupational health. So we usually get involved from that patient perspective. So if we do know that patient has been um, tested positive for infectious disease, that's where we come in play. We don't follow up on staff. And then um, there is entire process that these exposures go through. You want to make sure that uh, the incident report is filed, that the manager is aware, um, and also what goes into these incident reports includes what is the potential infectious agents, how, what was the type of injury, the mechanism or route of exposure, time and place of the incident, and also you want to put witnesses if there were any, and if there was first aid provided right there on site, and also whether that staff that's been exposed has used any PPE. So environmental specimens are actually something that we are collecting as IPAC. So you may find yourself in a situation that you will be collecting water, sewage. We, we may be collecting air samples. We may be collecting ultrasound gel samples, uh, swabbing sinks and pee traps or birthing tubs. So there is different environmental swabs that we may be asked to collect. And before you proceed, always um, call your lab, let them know that you will be um, doing some of these environmental specimen collection, let them know what it is, let them know what you're looking for, and they will tell you and send you specimens, sorry, um, the containers, what you need to use to, to send that um, to collect that in. So some of these are very straightforward, others not so much. So you have actually to talk to them and give them heads up. Don't just send stuff down and and they don't they don't know what it is. Um, when you send the specimens, it also has to come with a requisition. You may be able to print these requisition labels from your system, but usually it's the lab that will create it and they push it to your to your printer um, or the closest label printer that is to you, could be on that unit, could be somewhere, you just tell them where you are and they will push it to you. It takes no time at all to do that. When you're collecting your specimens, it's if it's something that you're collecting from either a patient room or um, if you are collecting like air samples, I will I would strongly advise you to make a map and mark your locations on your map and make sure you clearly label so um, they they do respond to the numbers of your labels. Sometimes I would also just use those extra labels and put them at the back of my map and mark 
if it's specimen one, I would just mark that this was my, my specimen one, specimen two collected. And then you put your little description there. So what was it? What room? What time, of course? Because all of these things are important when you are reviewing your data. Lab won't, likes to know these things, but they mostly have uh, importance in bearing more importance when you are reviewing your cases. When you get your results, how do we interpret them? So what is really, so this is one of the examples of two by two, for example, a table. So it's important that our results are actually showing the accuracy. So when you are looking into your sensitivity, sensitivity tests are the ones that will detect the true case of a disease or the absence of a false negative. So you want these sensitivities to be very clear to you when you're uh, preparing for, for your CAC exam. So sensitivity is the number of a true positive over the number of a true positive plus a false negative result. So your true positive and then you divide that by a true positive plus false negative, and that's the sensitivity. Your specific specificity is a number of a true negative over the number of true negatives plus false positives. So again, your true negatives, you divide that by true negatives plus false positives. So they're both expressed... Oh, Cornelia, mm -hmm. you said you divide true negative by false positive, but then you also said you add. So, on so if you imagine um, you have, let me just try to do this here. Um, So I'm going to try and make you a little formula here that may make more sense. Okay, true negative over true negative plus. Okay. So it's you're you're dividing your true negative true negative numbers, and at first you can say add true negative and and in your false positive that goes on the bottom, and then on the top because you're true negative. Does it make sense? Yeah, that makes more sense. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah I know it's it's really fun. hard to like talk the divisions in, in a sentence, right? Like it's easier when you when you write it as a formula. Okay. <laughs> so for precision, you always want to make sure that you are able to repeat the test and get the consistently same or similar result. So that's how you know that your result is, that your test is rather precise. So when you're doing, for example, screening and you identify a disease that is without signs or symptoms, which we have seen quite frequently, for example, it, with COVID, you do your, your screening tests tend to have a high clinical sensitivity, right? But um, when, you're conf when you're doing your confirmation test, you use it after a positive screen to ensure that now you want again to make sure you're getting that. So it's not a false positive because it is rather surprising to us at the beginning was really shocking to see that we had so many COVID positive patients that were walking around symptomatic or asymptomatic. So when you repeat the test and they come back positive again, that, is, that proves the precision of your test. So for diagnostic tests, you, you of course, you want to use them always in, in hand in hand with the clinical presentation, of course. So you always start with the idea of what your patient may have, and that's how you're de deciding on what type of test you want to do. And usually when you think about, like say, for example, I used here example of malaria. So proof of your presence of infectious agent is, is a proof that your patient has malaria. So if you find um, th that, there is a causative agent of malaria present in, in, in your test, 
in your results, you know that your patient is has that infectious agent. So it, it's no, no other way around it. It's the same thing like with your toxin from the C. diff, right? So that's definitive. It's there. So you know that toxin from C. diff cannot be present without actual microorganism. So you know for sure that this is the causative agent. So some of these also include your testing of your immunological response. So if you are looking, for example, for hepatitis tests, so you're looking into their antibody antigene reaction, and that's what you're looking in your serological testing. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so for your antigen detection, usually you will find um, that's your ELISA tests, so they're running those antigen tests, and when you look at them, they have the little, kind of like little, little vials, really, what they are, and you're looking into the changes, so you will see that they have this little clouding or some creations when they're um, running these tests. Usually, quite commonly, it's been used for HIV testing, um, Legionella, of course, for COVID, Hepatitis B, Hepatitis B, so they're running a particular um, um, a part of, of this particular, so you're looking into antigens, right? So it's not looking for the presence of the bacteria or the presence of virus, it's actually testing for the response. So when you're looking into your antibody detection, we're continuous with, so again, it's very similar procedure, similar idea. It's looking into the production of the antibodies or immunoglobulin that we, our bodies are producing. So you're looking for that as a response to um, a, a particular infectious agent. So you know that you cannot have a response to something that your body didn't meet. So you can't have an antibody to say um, hepatitis or COVID unless you have been exposed to it. So you're looking into the antibody presence and that's how you know that this is a confirmed diagnosis. So there is different um, types of th th different things we are looking for to determine whether somebody is in an active disease or if they are recovered or if you are looking into uh, immunity. So there is different markers that we are looking for, but um, there's just a way to diagnose whether someone has, so you have to know what you're looking for. So when you receive the results, so some of these questions on your CIC exam will be um, in a round, uh, uh, particular hepatitis, for example, there will have questions to ask you um, what, so what, what would be indicator of an infection or the, the blood result shows this antigen or the blood result shows um, that this antigen is on a rise and this one is lowering, what is that indication of uh, for for hepatitis, for example. So it could be either a new infection or a sign of recovery or sign that um, your patient has been immunized. So you have to know, look back at those uh, videos that I sent you with regards to hepatitis A, B, and C in particular, and looking at those curves from CDC. There is links that I posted to you guys, I think was for week four. So go revisit that, make sure you know what particular antibody and antigens get created at what stages of disease. So one of the um, kind of easy identifiers that someone told me, and I kind of stick with that for my my entire life ever since they told me is IgM is that immediate response and IgMs don't tend to stay long. So if you see that IgM is on a drop, it means that someone was having that immediate reaction. But then when you see the IgG, it's that means it's an older um, exposure. So you have IgG would never be as an immediate response to a new disease.
So when we are looking for your uh, infectious processes, we are looking into, of course, body fluids. So you can be collecting anything from pleural fluids, peritoneal fluids. There is different fluids that we collect depending on what we are looking at. They may also be tested for proteins or they could be looking at the cell count. They could be looking at presence of white blood cells. Your CSF is quite commonly collected when we are ruling out meningitis. And there is different ways of interpreting the CSF. Usually you want to know whether there is a bacterial growth or is there a viral uh, um, infection going on or fungal. So sometimes they will tell you that cloudy CSF is usually an indicator of bacterial infection or clear hazy would be an indicator of viral or fungal infection. That's all nice, but you want to have an actual lab report supporting that. So for your CPE, so those are kind of interesting when you get these results. So sometimes it will take some time to actually determine whether your organism that tests positive is a true CPE. Some labs will say it right there in a heading that is a CPE. Sometimes you have to actually look at that antibiotic resistance. So most commonly you will find that with your E. coli or Klebs species that they are resistant to carbapenems and when they are it will come up on your routine test you don't have to call the lab and say hey i just wonder if they if they are showing any resistance it will be on your on your report right there it also will happen sometimes that they do um, run additional tests and they will correct the reports and you have to be on top of it. I had some report come to me and it tested as ESBL and we didn't do anything because we didn't isolate the patients for ESBL and me being a hoarder, I just went back for whatever reason I was looking for at this patient's chart and uh, I, I discovered that they corrected the report, but they didn't actually send a follow-up. So apparently they don't have to, they usually do it as a courtesy when they do that. So it is our responsibility to check these results even after. So it has happened so that um, nothing really uh, was, there is no transmission, but I had a lot of work to do to follow up to, to this particular case. So it does happen. So keep your eyes open. So you guys know the CPE has a high fatality rate. I don't think I need to repeat that. So this is why we are concerned with CPEs and they're resistant to all penicillins and cephalosporins. So that's something to keep in mind. So if you get, for example, um, a question on your exam that says E. coli that's resistant to all penicillins, like you don't need to know what to treat E. coli with, but if it tells you that is resistant to all penicillins and cephalosporins, you should that should tell you this is my CPE. So for your COVID results, you guys, I'm sure you all know this, but let's just go for for the um, for the uh, argument of our exams and tests and our own knowledge go through it. Your COVID results are coming in and you will either receive um, a final or preliminary results. Usually I rarely see preliminary results unless we are looking at something, we are in an outbreak and we are pushing them to tell us results. Usually it's a final exam. Most of our results and is gold standard is your PCR test. So they're really quick and in a turnaround, you get them back within the test itself runs about six hours. So within 12 hours from sending your result, you should get sorry, sending your specimen, you should get a result. Um, sometimes you will receive an invalid test. So that could be either that um, they, there was something wrong with the specimen itself. Usually there is a possibility that something went wrong on the line while processing the specimen. Uh, so it's a lab error, or it could be that your CT values are too high. So if they say, if your result comes back and says invalid, follow up and see what, 
what is behind it, what does that mean, why is it invalid. So if your CT values are high, you always want to repeat that test to see whether that CT value is moving down. It doesn't move up usually, it moves down. If it's a new infection, CT values drop. And when you are asked which test to choose, PCR over rapid test, always choose a PCR. And um, with PCR tests, you will get your CT values and you can further test for the variance of concern where with rapid tests, we can't do that. So for your HEP A, it's you're, you're usually looking at a report that will tell you it is positive for hepatitis A. And if you, if you get a result that speaks about presence of IgG and there is no IgM present, it doesn't mention it or it tells you it's not there, it tells you that that, that patient is immune to hepatitis A. If you get a positive result, it doesn't mean that your patient is have active infection. It just tells you that there is the IgG in there, right? So for positive result for hepatitis A, and it does test positive for IgM. So with or without a positive hepatitis A IgG, so that will tell you that's that recent or acute. Uh, stage of infection. So remember when I said that M immediate and G go, the person who told me was think about old gold and M for immediate. So it kind of stuck in my head the way she explained to me. And I, every time I look at it, I think every time I see IgM, I think about recent or acute infection. So if I see IgG, I think this is not something to be concerned with because there is no IgM. And so also you can be looking into different types of results that may present on your um, on your lab report. So it could be something that is also cross-reacting. So whenever you get any confusing results that are unclear and you can't figure out, always ask them to, to do run another test. So I have posted this document for you and I refer to this quite often myself because I just can't keep all this information in my head. It's, there is other pieces of important information that clutter my mind. And um, so every time you get your lab results, you will find whether there is the HBSAG, or uh, anti-HBC, so and it you go back to this table and you will t you can actually figure out which one is it. Is it susceptible? Is it acutely ill? Is it someone who is has a chronic condition, or is it someone who has developed immunity? So it's exactly the same here on this left side. What what is in in that? chart, I will tell you, have it printed for your exam if you can, and just keep it on your desk so you can quickly glance over because I can't remember this. I have been memorizing it every time I need to write my exam, and it's just something I can't keep in my head forever. It just evaporates, so I don't know if there is a way to actually use this. If, I think if you're using it on a regular basis, and if you see a lot of hepatitis cases, you probably, it gets ingrained in your brain, but otherwise I, I refer always to these documents. Okay, so for your measles, you, there's a couple of things that they may ask you to collect. Usually they will ask you for either an MP swab or a throat swab. Quite commonly, you may be asked to collect the CSF or urine. So then again, there is, you want to make sure you are informing your public health unit and public health lab because these specimens are going to be processed by the public health lab. 
And it's one of those that is immediately reportable. So if you look back into that sheet that we discussed about the reportable diseases that changed recently the name to diseases of public health significance, you will see that some of them are either bolded or have a little star on next to them. And that indicates those are immediately reportable. So for all your reportable diseases, we had a brief discussion there and I know ent my entire response got deleted to you guys. So um, it goes into IFAS. It's a system that public health units run. It's up to be changed. So they're working on a different system that will be more integrated. Um, so from the IFAS, Ministry of Health has access to it. Public Health Ontario has access to it. You can actually go on public health page and filter through the diseases and see the trends. Also, these reports go to PHAC, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and then we are part of um, uh, participating countries that do report to World Health Organization. So there is also links that I put in that discussion for you to take a look. It's kind of cool to see how many countries are actually sharing that information. So you can see maps and how the countries that are contributing and sharing information about all communicable diseases in their areas, how they're shaded differently. So you have the ones that are participating and the ones that are not. It is important for us to know because as I said, the world's become a global village. So, so for your TB, when there is a couple of things that you need to know. There is a follow-up and I have included this in here as well. And there is also, I will post it also to our discussion. So this document actually speaks about um, risks of exposure. So when you're following up on a TB case, after we collected all the specimens, send them, now we got the results back. So what? how do you interpret that? Usually you will get a result that says, uh, AFB test positive. So you still don't know what is it. It could be anything that is fluorescing under the, the microscope. But uh, what you, at this point, I hope your patient is in isolation because we were collecting that sputums. So that was initially a deal. So we have now to find out what is it, whether they are a true TB or is it MAC. Uh, so you can't tell still at this point if it, only telling you that is acid fast bacilli seen. And then it will tell you four, three, two, or one plus, and that tells you how many uh, microorganisms are there. So I will post this picture in a little bit better for you to see, and it actually tells you whether what's the risk associated. So when you're looking into these microorganism and number of colonies that they do see, you also accompany that with a clinical presentation. So whether your patient had uh, chest x-ray that was showing suspicion on the chest x-ray of TB. Did they have, did they present with symptoms? So did they come with uh, to ER saying, I had a cough for last four weeks, it's not stopping. I have low grade fever, night sweats, weight, uh, weight loss, and hemoptysis are your typical signs and symptoms. You always want to wait for culture tests and we always, always send for culture tests. Other test that is used and it's much faster is your PCR test. So we can get that as well. So this is exactly what is on that um, sheet from before. Just uh, I put it in a table for you guys. So you will see that when you see one plus, it's rare. Two plus is considered few. Three plus is considered moderate. And four plus is considered numerous. Um, AFB colonies on on the actual staining right on the slides. So you always follow up with your microbacterial cultures because that's where you figure out what's going on, what is growing. I had um, a patient that I have taken off precautions and my lesson learned. So I actually spoken to somebody in the hospital and they were saying, oh, this patient can't possibly have TB. They're not presenting with this. So I went to talk to respirologist and she too agreed that this is not TB and they're likely gonna be just MAC and um, it's not makes no sense to keep this patient on six weeks for on isolation while we are waiting for the cultures to return. 
So I bring this back to, to my team and my management, and we all agree to take this patient off precautions because who would better know than respirologists, right? So we follow them in, in steps and I break the rules completely break the rules. And um, it turns out later I get a culture that was positive for uh, TB and I was devastated. It wasn't, it was not um, a high number. It was one plus, but I was absolutely devastated knowing that I have exposed my colleagues and um, the the roommates of this patient. So um, I actually went straight to the director of, of that particular department and sat my story behind in her office and told her what has happened. So, and I was ready to get yelled at and, you know, disciplined in so many ways. And she said, it's human. We all make mistakes. You followed, you consulted so many people. So, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go and talk to, to the team. And she said, do you want to get murdered right now? <laughs> I said, well, if that's the end of me, that's it. But I have to go and talk to these people and tell them what happened. So, of course, I had and huddled with my unit, with, with my team. And, oh, boy, I, I do, cannot tell you the, the, the eyes and the, the, the disappointment in, in those people's eyes. And um, what I've learned from that is stick to your rules. No matter what and no matter who tells you what, the, the sleep that I lost and, and the trust that I lost, that they lost in me was absolutely significant. So definitely stick to your rules, wait for, for confirmation to get what you have. Of course, based on these numbers, it was nothing to be concerned about because it does take over 60 consecutive hours to be exposed and there is no follow-up with anyone not even the the patients that were in this room because no one spent that amount of time considering the number of colonies that we found but it was absolutely devastating to me that my decision has actually put people at risk so that's my lesson to you so um when, again, what is really important to know that every specimen, including your sputum specimens, can be contaminated. And if your specimens contains more than 10 epithelial cells, they're considered unacceptable. And doesn't matter what else grows in it, they, you just collect fresh specimens, start from scratch. So your PCR or NAT test, you guys know that's quite quite um, quite a thing these days. Everybody knows it. Here is the Nobel Prize winner in the corner, the gentleman. I'm sorry, sorry, Cornelia, I missed the slide before this. Can you put it back just one, please? Sure. This one. Yes, that one. Just give me a minute. Yes, thank you. No problem. So this is your PCR test or NAT test. Everyone knows about this, as I said. So um, kind of investigating about the test and who found, who discovered it or created it. I actually found out that this, this lovely gentleman has done a lot of work in his private lab, like Marina's kid, but um, he, he's done a lot, of, um, a lot of work while he was on LSD, so interesting findings. Um, and I don't know that he has actually put anyone at risk to TB like I did. And I was not on LSD, so just something to keep in mind. Uh, so it is uh, actually a, a system that does take a fragment of um, of either DNA or RNA, and then it amplifies it. So it kind of works like a photocopy machine in a way. So it recreates whatever is there. So that's the reason why people say you cannot have a um, a false negative on these. So if it's there, it's there. If it's not there, it's not there. You can't amplify something that's not there. So if it's something picking up, I know I, I have 
been reading about how it works and like I was just impressed with with the entire explanation of it I've never actually seen it in action but I know like I've seen the videos and all that but never in real life so it would be kind of cool to see that in real life how it works so it does, uh, we use it for TB, for COVID, for HIV, and it does pick up on RNA or DNA, and it has amazing, like, quick turnaround time. As I said, it's, uh, I think it does depend on the machine as well. The, the ones that I have been dealing with, it's um, six hours from the cassette entry to reading of the result. So that's it. So I think I, every time I tell you a story, I tell you something funny and I tell you something that is that went horribly wrong in my career and I share that with you with no shame because I think it's important that uh, we share good experiences and lessons learned. So that's from me. I know we passed our time. I apologize for that. We ran Hello. out of... Hello. Hello. I'm so sorry. Can I can I see the the slide that you had on TB um, sputum collection, please? Uh, the one before that. That that's right. That's right. Oh, it's the AFB test. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you so much. Oh, Anita, 7 p.m. Eh? Hmm. And sunny. We had rain. All right. So no class tomorrow. And I urge you and invite you, please don't be shy. If you have any questions, do send me email. You can feel free. You can text me on that number. That's my personal cell phone. You can ask me anything. I'm happy to help you if you have any questions. It is in my interest to help you through and have you pass this exam and see you through getting your CIC letters behind your names, and I'd be happy to be in any little way um, helping you to get there. Thank you, Cornelia. That's amazing. Definitely, we'll keep in contact with you. <laughs> so, what are you asking me? Can we go back to the slides on the website? Yes, you can. Yes. Do we have class next Friday? Um. Yes. Oh. Okay. I know, I know. I was thinking the same. Like, <laughs> oh, what? Uh, no, no, we do. We have to meet. Yes. Okay, okay. No, yeah, next week we are going to. We be... don't have a class, right? We have a break in one class. I just don't remember. That's what right. Week. So the week after, you have a break. And then, uh, so the uh, ninth, there is going to be no class. But on the ninth, I'm opening your quiz. So I'm going to open that. And you have like eight ninth at midnight so thursday on friday it's gonna be open for you you can start writing but uh, it's gonna stay open until the 18th so you have some time and, oh so we do uh, have like a week or so yeah okay. you have nine days but uh, you have to write it in one seating right mm -hmm. so you can't open up and go come back so if you start writing and you do 10 questions that's only going to be 10 questions and that's going to be counted as only your mark yeah yeah the only um, problem with all of that is if anyone's internet goes out you're kind of screwed <laughs> yeah so the, don't worry if, if things go awfully wrong for us in any way as you know i've been flexible and accommodating to you guys so if mm -hmm. things do go wrong but if out of 40 of you 25 tell me my internet <laughs> <laughs> failed I'll, I'll be i'll be a little bit concerned with your <laughs> internet connection well i'm actually very happy to hear that because i was trying to figure out like what the date is because my brother's getting married on the 10th and oh, I, was like, I was like oh my god like how am i supposed to do all these wedding festivities and try to write an exam oh you <laughs> so know you better bring your, bring your t bring your test and ask all the attendees the questions yes <laughs> perfect so, yeah, so we have over a week. I think it's enough for everyone to to give you some time to enter. So you have time to refresh and read and then start writing. Sounds good. Thank you. Have a good night, Cornelia. Good night, good night guys. Everybody.